What's going on YouTube? It is Pete coming in hot with another video, also known as that guy Pete. You refuse to invite to gatherings. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm hanging in. Made it through another tax deadline, so I slayed another tax dragon. Got one left. The October deadline coming up. But it has been mentally exhausting, to say the least. Um, but what we're here to do today, we're here to talk about a book called Why Beautiful People Have More Daughters. It was a book, I think, written in 2007. So we definitely have made some discoveries. This is pre-Manosphere, like before it really started taking off. So obviously there's some insights in this book. And also some of the cursory and rudimentary things that we talk about in the manosphere obviously had some sort of following um, long before it became more mainstream in the space and thus garnered the pseudoscientific label that it currently possesses. Now, unlike most of my videos for book reviews, I didn't take notes for this one. We're going to actually go through the book itself together don't worry i'm not going to read the whole thing to you otherwise we'd be here forever but anticipate a long video so as always you know look at what's relevant to you and watch that part and so on and so forth you don't have to watch the whole thing in one sitting um that being said uh, i apologize in advance for that transgression but i just i'm so mentally exhausted that like sitting down and taking notes i just I couldn't do it, but um, it was a good read, a lot of content, and I'm thinking maybe an unintended benefit of going through the book this way is that really you're going to see the meat of um, what we talk about here, okay? So the way this video is going to go is I'm going to start just by telling you about the authors, okay? And then what we're going to do is pretty much from introduction to conclusion, we're going to go through this book <clears throat> with the explicit aim of answering many of these questions posed to evolutionary psychology. So we're going to begin with what evolutionary psychology is and compare evolutionary evolutionary psychology to the widely accepted standard social science model. We'll kind of tell you what the comparison is between those two. We'll talk about the Savannah Principle. Um, then we're going to move on to chapter two of why men and women are so different. We're going to talk about culture and some of the puzzles and questions that's going to lead to. Chapter 3 is going to be called Barbie, Manufactured by Mattel, Designed by Evolution, right? And we're going to answer questions such as, why do men like blonde bombshells, and why do women want to look like them, right? So think like makeup and all this shit, like why, why are we doing this? Why is beauty not in the eye of the beholder and skin deep? So kind of a black pill question, right? Why is the standard of beauty a little bit more objective then we like to admit, sure, it can be influenced by certain variables in the environment, but overall, generally, uh, people tend to agree on what the standard of beauty is. Why is prostitution the world's oldest profession, and why is porn a billion-dollar industry? That's a good question from an evolutionary perspective. Um, why Sean Connery and Catherine Zeta-Jones, but not Lauren uh, Bacall and Brad Pitt? So this is like the age gap between man and woman question. Um, why do men and women perceive the same situation differently? Why does he see a duck and she sees a goose, right? So that's going to be a bunch of questions we're going to unpack there. We're then going to move on to chapter four and talk about uh, go together like horse and carriage. Um, so why are there virtually no polyandrous societies? This was the question that I was researching that ultimately led me to the author's of this book um, and then uh, from there I found this book and decided to give it to read so that's kind of one of the questions I wanted to know about why and how are contemporary Westerners polygynous contrary to popular belief of um, you know monogamy so this is gonna kind of be a counterpoint to um, Miss Pearson's um, hypothetical evolved monogamy in her um, lifting the wrapping of the manosphere. This is going to kind of be a counter to that. Why does having sons reduce the likelihood of divorce? That's an interesting question. 
why are diamonds a girl's best friend? And why might handsome men make bad husbands? The cat and dad question. That always comes up, right? But remember, this book came out in 2007. I do not know what the status of strategic pluralism, that is, you know, uh, alpha fucks, beta bucks, what that strategy, how it was viewed in the scientific community at that time, what it was. But we have since then switched to mate switching hypothesis, which instead of alpha fucks, beta bucks, is just the simple idea that um, if I'm ready, willing, and able to make a switch, I will. You know, women upgrading to a higher status. Um, taller guy or whatever it is and you know Leonardo DiCaprio upgrading to a new 25 year old or whatever it is you know that's the idea of kind of mate switching trading up now after that chapter we move on to chapter five Uh, some things are more important than money so we explore what influences the sex of your child maybe it's not as by chance as we think why does the baby have daddy's eyes but not mommy's why Are there so many deadbeat dads, but so few deadbeat moms? That is, why are women more invested in the kids' well-being than the dads are, on average? Why is family more important to women than to men? Why do girls of divorced parents experience puberty earlier compared to the ones that uh, aren't daughters of divorced parents? That's pretty much the core of this. We move on to chapter six after that, Guys Gone Wild. This is the the male aggression chapter, basically. Why are almost all violent criminals men? What do Bill Gates and Paul McCartney have in common with criminals? Why does marriage settle men down? Why are some men abusive? So that's kind of the chapter on men and kind of like why we are the way we are. And then we have chapter eight. I mean, chapter 7, I'm sorry, this is chapter 6, just chapter 7, forgive me. My handwriting is atrocious, as some say, while others like it, but sometimes I can't even read my own shit, so there you go, there you have it. Chapter 7, life's not fair or politically correct. This is something we say in the manosphere all the time, and this chapter kind of wants to dive into the evolutionary aspects of that. So, for example, why do politicians risk it all for an affair, right? Why do men earn more and attain higher status on average? This has changed, obviously, with the brain over brawn economy and things like this, women getting their own LMS now. But remember, this book was written in 2007. So I guess maybe we'll explore that more. Why are most neurosurgeons male and teachers female? Just like why are most men in STEM male? Um, While social care, why is most of it female? Why is sexual harassment so persistent? That's another question. So these are good questions to ask and try to figure out a biological evolutionary explanation for it. And then the last chapter is the good, bad, and ugly. So for those of you um, who are probably, there's going to be some of you that are going to get offended by these questions, but I promise you in no way, shape, or form is this book going to try to um, condemn or shame or promote or anything like that. It just wants to answer the question based on what's being observed in the world. Where did religion come from, right? To think that that might be an evolutionarily evolved thing, that might be uncomfortable for some for some of you to entertain as an idea, but he does explore it here. Why are women more religious than men? Why are most suicide bombers Muslim? This is probably the most offensive question asked in the book, but the author at the beginning of the book states very clearly that anticipate these types of questions. This is probably going to tie a little bit into the um, the incel situation. You'll see why when we get there. But um, obviously, the average incel, nowhere near as extreme as this, of course. So next is, why is ethnic and nationalist conflict so persistent? You know, so many countries and, and borders and land have been fought over, over nationalist and ethnic lines, right? Just, I, I can't help but think about the, uh, the Balkans, right? A lot of that. Um, and then we have the last question, why single women travel more than single men? Why is that? Right. And that's pretty much all the questions we're going to be going through today. So I'm kind of done with the board because I told you the, um, the uh, different way I'm going to do this. This is kind of, kind of be a blend of book review and reading article format the way I'm going to do it. And after this, we're just going to kind of go through the conclusion with some unanswered questions Um, that have kind of been plaguing um, the minds of evolutionary psychologists for a long time, trying to figure it out. 
Some questions they did successfully answer, some of them they didn't, but may have been answered since then, since 2007, so on and so forth, okay? So let's begin now that I've given you this very huge uh, introduction and layout of what this video is going to entail. As I warned you all, it's going to be a long one. The intro should give you an idea of how long. Um, we're going to begin with the authors now, so let's go. So we're talking about Alan Miller first. He was a professor of social psychology in the Department of Behavioral Sciences at Hokkaido University, Japan. And he was also an affiliate associate professor of sociology at the University of Washington. And unfortunately, at, at I think at the age of 43 or 44, or something like that, he died in 2003. So he is no longer with us. However, the other author, Satoshi Kanazawa, he is a reader in management and research methodology at the London School of Economics and Political Science, an honorary research fellow in the Department of Psychology of the University of London and Birkbeck College. And he was the first to introduce modern evolutionary psychology to sociology. So very much before he started really asking these questions about evolutionary psychology, he was a sociologist himself. Okay, so these two guys got together and they wrote this book. So, beginning with the introduction of the book. So this book, at its core, what is it about? It's about human nature, male and female. We want to understand um, human nature for what it is. So, what this implies when we talk about human nature, the first thing is that everything psychologically in humans, our thoughts, how we behave, how we feel about things, Yes, our environment does play a role in that, but also understand that over time, from the ancestral environment, more on that later, we have evolved, you know, emotional suites, emotional, psychological, and mental behaviors and things like this. And because human nature is a universal thing, which is sometimes shared um, by all humans, or in the case of differences between men and women, sometimes it's just by your own sex. Male and female nature is different. Men and women are different above and below the neck. Um, yeah, the, the implication is that human nature is universal, that we all share it. And this is despite the seemingly vast cultural differences that we observe in the world. But you're going to see later on as we go through it that these differences are more surface level than anything. You know, a country's culture versus human culture. Human culture is kind of governed by this ancestral environment um, that evolved over countless millennia. While the surface stuff, you're going to see that, yes, there's differences between it, but the themes are the same. Okay? Now, the thing is this. When you're talking about sociologists, social scientists, and things like that, they tend to be environmental determinists. They believe that individual experiences and social environments completely determine human behavior, and there are no roles played by genetic and biological factors. Now, obviously, those who watch my channel, they understand that epigenetics is a thing. The genetic wheelhouse is all you could potentially be, and all those genes could potentially express themselves. And what happens to those genes? Well, basically, they cook in the environmental oven and based on the type of oven that it cooked in a series of genes will express themselves and basically what the sociologists will say is that well when it basically once you get to here or maybe more specifically once you get to here inside the skull you get to the brain uh, that's kind of where this whole evolution shtick stops Right. While the evolutionary psychologist will say um, it's not it's neither 100 percent determined by genetics or 100 percent determined by environment. It's kind of a combination of the two. Right. And when you think about that intuitively, it, it sort of makes sense. Right. Now, one of the first things that the author really, really wants to drive home here is that we are seeking to try to look at this for what it is. We're not trying to give any value judgments on what things ought to be. We're not trying to say, hey, this is moral, this is not. 
So we're trying to avoid two types of fallacies here. The first one is the naturalistic fallacy. And um, for those who don't know, George Edward Moore was an English philosopher who came up with that term. Okay? And it's the idea that what is ought to be. What is natural is good. So just to kind of give you an example of that, because people are genetically different and endowed with different innate abilities and talents, they ought to be treated differently. Not necessarily true. But on the flip side, we have the opposite, which is called the moralistic fallacy. And this came from a microbiologist, Bernard Davis. Okay, it's essentially the opposite of the naturalistic fallacy. And it goes from ought to is. And it's the tendency to believe that what is good is natural and what ought to be is. For example, you might say, because everyone ought to be treated equally, there are no genetic differences between people. Right? Because it's more convenient for us to say, hey, uh, we want equality, so we're just going to assume there is no differences that go to the genetic root. Because if it goes to the genetic root, that's kind of inconvenient. Right? And I've done a whole series on ethics, and I can tell you, there's so many different opinions about it. You can tell that there's some subjectivity, if not mostly subjectivity, um, despite the fact that, yes, there are some universals that are kind of in line with survival and, you know, goals of the human race. Like, hey, don't kill each other, because obviously that's counterintuitive. But, you know, for the most part, there's a lot of subjective aspects of morality. So that's kind of the two fallacies that he says, hey... Be aware of this. We are not going to go into naturalistic fallacy or moralistic fallacy territory here. We're not going to try to give commentary on what is ought to be or what ought therefore is the case. We're just going to look at it like this is what it is, and that's it. And if it's inconvenient for your worldview, so be it. And he also goes into the idea about stereotypes, right? Many stereotypes are empirical generalizations with a statistical basis and thus on average tend to be true. The, the saying goes, stereotypes exist because they're true, right? But the only problem is that you can't apply a stereotype to every single situation. But on a balance of probabilities, yes, the stereotype will likely hold, which is why it exists. So they just wanted to make that clear. Basically, what I always say on my channel, there are no absolutes. There are always exceptions. And yes, we acknowledge the acceptance of the concession, of, of the acceptance, exceptions. Man, I can't fucking talk today. Concessions, acceptance, exceptions say that five times fast um the idea is that essentially when you're looking at stereotypes it gives us a general understanding of how the world works around us an exception if anything proves the rule it does not negate the rule but i will tell you that people will build their entire world view around an exception and then say that is what the world must be. Which is not the case. Of course. But what the world is at large probably doesn't mean much to an individual who is living their experience. So yeah. It's abundantly clear that we're just going to look at the information for what it is. And whether it's kind or unkind to groups, um, that's sort of irrelevant. We're interested in just what is. And that's pretty much the introduction. He just really wanted to preface the book with that. So now we're going to jump into chapter one. What is evolutionary psychology? What is that? Well, as I have said, it's a relatively new field. And it all stemmed from a book called The Adapted Mind, Evolutionary Psychology and the Generation of Culture. Right? And this book was published, I believe, in 1992. So that's not too long ago. Okay, but essentially what we're trying to do is say, hey, instead of just looking at the environment, just as we look at, hey, why are we evolved to have five digits on each hand? Why are our eyes a certain way? Why is our nose? Why are our feet and legs a certain way? Why is our brain a certain way? And that's sort of the question that we are asking here. Now, what he wants to do is he wants to make a sharp contrast uh, between the standard social science model and the evolutionary psychology model. And he does this by targeting four basic principles. So under the standard social science model, the first major thing is that humans are exempt from biology. 
Basically, humans are special. Human exceptionalism, right? So, you know, dogs have evolved behavior. Cats have evolved behavior. Horses and cows have evolved behavior. But humans don't. It's entirely shaped by the environment. We're special. The second is evolution stops at the neck. The idea that uh, the brain is an exception in the human body. It kind of builds and piggybacks off of point one. Right? Yes, they agree that our hands, our eyes, our feet, and all that evolved a certain way. But once you start talking about the brain, hey, man, you're talking crazy, man. <laughs> That's kind of where the line goes. And then the third one is uh, human nature is tabula rasa. For those of you who do not know what tabula rasa means, it means blank slate. Your brain is a blank slate. It's a canvas, whatever you want to call it. Start writing your environmental shit on it. Start painting your, your stuff on it, right? From the very beginning, there is absolutely zero difference between one human compared to the next. They all start as a blank slate, and the environment fully shapes that human. That's the human nature's tabula rasa. Um, point. And then the last point is that human behavior, building off of point three, is a product almost entirely of environment and socialization. Quite literally, environmentalism, right? And that the environment and life experiences almost entirely shape and determine human behavior. Now, this is overly simplified, but that being said, it is the core principles of the standard social science model. So again, humans are exempt from biology, human exceptionalism. The human brain did not evolve as the brains of others evolved. Human minds are blank slate, and they are entirely shaped by the environment. Now, evolutionary psychology counters this. And they say that, first off, people are animals. We are mammals, just like gorillas, um, just like chimpanzees. We, we are mammals. Okay, which means that, hey, if these other mammals are governed by these rules of evolved brains and behaviors, then so are we. Second, there's nothing special about the human brain, right? Very much like any other part of the body, the eyes, the feet, the hands, and so on. The brain also has adaptive um, advantages to it that were molded in this ancestral environment. And that's why we have the features of the human brain that we have today. Human nature is innate. It is not something that you just, you know, open up the canvas and you design human nature. No. Human nature, it's part of the genetic code, just like anything else. Right? So when you look at that, you realize very quickly that just as there are genetics that make your eyes blue versus your eyes brown, there are genetics that might make you more prone to certain types of behaviors. It is not entirely shaped by environment. For example, alcoholism, right? If your parents were alcoholics, there's a good chance you could end up an alcoholic. And you can argue, hey, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe you never touched the stuff. But again, the susceptibility to it is there. That's an example of a potential human behavior being heritable. Now, human behavior, this is point four, is the product of both innate human nature and the environment. So unlike the former, evolutionary psychology makes a concession that yes, environment does play a role. It absolutely plays a role in the development of the individual, of course. But while you're baking in the oven, 23 chromosomes from mom, 23 chromosomes from pop, this is the genetic wheelhouse. This is what you are. This is all that could potentially express itself. That in combination with the environment is what could allow us to predict your behavior. In other words, Potentially, the human is knowable inside and out. And from there, he talks about this idea called the Savannah Principle. So what is the Savannah Principle? Well, for those who have studied the evolution of humans, 
we all kind of started out in the savannah on the African continent. And the human body, including the brain, evolved over millions of years in said African savannah and elsewhere on Earth as they branched out. Went to the Arabian Peninsula, some went up into Russia and then left, some went directly through like modern day Turkey and went into the Balkans and spread out in Europe that way. Some kept going east, they went to, you know, China, Japan, some went up and across the Bering Strait, went to the Americas, some got on boats and went to modern day Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. You get the idea, people spread out, all right? But... We had this ancestral environment where humans lived in small bands of 150 or so related individuals as hunter-gatherers. And this is the environment of evolutionary adaptedness or the ancestral environment. So the ancestral environment is where our bodies, including our brains, were adapted. So even though we live in the 21st century today, we still have Stone Age brain, which I have... Um, affectionately referred to on my channel repeatedly as Ooga Booga. You can take people out of the Ooga Booga, that is, you can take them out of the ancestral environment and dump them into a, um, a modern environment, but you can't take the Ooga Booga out of people. Not without, you know, adaptive behaviors in a stable environment for many generations consistently replicating. And that's another talk later on in the video. So everything we see around us today, cities, nation states, houses, roads, governments, writing, contraception, TV, telephones, computers, came about in the last 10,000 years, and these are all forms of social engineering. Oofy doofy, which is another thing we talk about. So our entire body is adapted to the ancestral environment where none of these things existed. So these things are evolutionarily novel by comparison. So, you know, we weren't ready for these things in terms of how we're wired. We weren't built for that. We were built for the ancestral environment is the basic gist of the Savannah principle, right? So if we were to sum it up, we would say that the human brain has difficulty on a subconscious level, comprehending and dealing with an entity and situation that did not exist in the ancestral environment, right? So for example, right, sweet foods, fatty foods, high caloric intake, relatively scarce in the ancestral environment. Now we have an environment where we have sweets are everywhere. Fat is everywhere. So now we have an obesity problem. You would not have had that issue in the ancestral environment. So this is an example of how what used to be evolutionarily sound in the ancestral environment is now maladaptive, which just means that it's working against us now. Very similarly with male sexual jealousy, right? This is another evolved psychological mechanism that hasn't quite caught up to modern times. Now, in the ancestral environment, it solved the problem of reproduction by allowing men who possessed it to maximize paternity certainty. Is the baby mine? And minimize the risk of cuckoldry, unknowingly raising offspring that is not your own. And it's not just human males that have a problem with being in this situation. Some species even go as far as infanticide. They wipe out the offspring of their rivals. So it's not uniquely human. And in the ancestral environment, this sexual jealousy and mate guarding tactic made sense. However, now sex and reproduction in the modern environment, they're separated. Just because you fuck it doesn't mean a baby's gonna result, right? We have reliable methods of birth control. And, you know, infidelity doesn't always lead to childbirth like it used to. So mates also will not have to waste their resources on someone else's child on a balance of probabilities. And also we have DNA tests. These types of things um, on paper allow us to figure out paternity. But again, this has not been the norm for a sufficient amount of time where it has become the new ooga booga. So the idea that an adulterous wife was on the pill at the time of her sexual infidelity probably offers very little consolation to the man. His evolutionary response dictates, um, or rather his evolutionary wiring dictates his response. 
And he highlights this point that I just mentioned with taking, you can't take the Ooga Booga out of people. Evolution takes many generations. And so the speed of evolution of a species is relative to how long it takes for individuals of the species to mature sexually. So obviously for a species that mature faster, they're going to evolve more quickly. They don't need an environment to be as stable for as prolonged a period of time in order for a meaningful change to the genome to occur. But a slow evolving species, they do need that consistency. So if you don't have a stable, unchanging environment for many, many generations, basically you have all these changes happening in rapid succession. Think industrial revolution and digital age. All these things happening and natural selection can't keep up. This obviously is not the ancestral Ooga Booga. But I, I don't know what to select for, what to select against, what's deleterious, what's not. And, you know, this is why we have the dysgenic clown world. Because again, social engineering has had a profound effect on things like mate selection and things like this. Because again, we're not interested in the ancestral environment in modern times, but our brains very much are still wired for the ancestral environment. So trying to adapt to these novel changes would be the equivalent of me making you take five shots put a dart in your right hand, put a blindfold on you, spin you around 20 times, then quickly pull off the blindfold, you get hit with the light, and then I say, okay, hit a bullseye on the dartboard. You're trying to hit a moving target. And obviously, easier said than done. So, I mean, that's kind of the basic gist of what we're talking about in evolutionary psychology. This idea that, no, humans very much are evolved animals just like any other species on the planet we're just the dominant species just as you know before that asteroid hit dinosaurs were right dinosaurs were dominant before mammals if if my um my study of science is correct <laughs> but on top of that the fact that humans are animals just like anyone else we're wired for an environment that no longer really exists. And of course, that creates what we call an evolutionary mismatch, which I have talked about extensively already. So those who watch my channel regularly should know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, here's the thing. In chapter two, we talk about why are men and women so different, right? We always talk about this idea that Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. These people are very different, okay? Don't get me wrong. They're both homo sapiens. There's, there's no doubt about that. But psychologically speaking, the way these two are wired, they might as well be different species, at least in the psychological, you know, non-physical sense. Now, when asking the question, why are men and women so different? Well, we have to start with the standard social science model. What do the sociologists say? Well, among them, they say it's gender socialization. Gender is a social construct. And you still hear this on the gender studies classes to this day, right? And anything that goes against that, of course, is inconvenient for any narrative or what have you. So according to the, uh, this explanation, men and women, boys and girls, they think and behave differently because they've been socialized by culture and society. Oofy doofy has made them different. That's kind of the idea here. Since the day of their birth, boys and girls are treated differently and socialized either as boys or girls. Boys are encouraged to be aggressive and violent by being given toy trucks and toy guns, while girls are taught to be caring and nurturing by being given dolls and tea sets. Right? But evidence now available from science demonstrates that this view is false. And he cites two studies, beginning with the sex differences that appear on the first day of life. So University of Cambridge psychologist Simon Baron Cohen and his associates have conducted a careful experiment with one-day-old babies. So they went up to these one-day-old babies and they showed them a picture of a woman's face and a mechanical mobile, which I'm guessing is a car, right? 102 newborn babies, 44 boys, 58 girls. And the researchers themselves, obviously, so that there's no bias, um, they were unaware of the sex of the baby. 
they didn't know. So they videotaped the babies looking at the photos and saying, okay, well, which photo is the baby looking at for prolonged periods of time compared to the other one? And their analysis showed that more boys prefer to look at the mechanical mobiles and boys on average gazed at those longer while the girls gazed at the human face longer. So if you're trying to say that the differences between men and women are entirely guided by socialization, how can these babies be socialized differently within 24 hours is kind of the point, right? And just to kind of drive it even further, he cites another thing. Um, sex differences in, are shared by monkeys as well. So Jerry Ann, M. Alexander, and Melissa Hines, they gave two stereotypically masculine toys, a ball and a police car, two stereotypically feminine toys, a soft doll and a cooking pot, and two neutral toys, a picture book and a stuffed dog, to 44 male and 44 female monkeys. They then assessed the monkey's preference for each toy by measuring how much time they spent with them. And, as you would expect, if you, you know, have read the literature, the female monkeys preferred the female toys, while the male monkeys preferred the male toys. So, what does this show us? Well, it shows us at the core, men and women are not different because they are socialized differently. They are socialized differently because they are different. What men and, wa what men and women want is different. What interests men and women is different. What their goals are is different. So now this, asks, this raises the question, all right, fine, fair enough. The standard social science model gives an unsatisfactory answer to why men and women are different. So if that's not the cause of these differences, then what is? Well, first we begin with this concept called anisogamy, which means that the female sex cell, the egg, is larger in size and fewer in number than the male sex cell, sperm. This is nothing new. And it's the biological definition of male and female. The female of any sexually reproducing species is defined as the sex that produces the largest sex cell and the male by default is the other sex. Anisogamy means that the egg is biologically far more valuable than the sperm. In nature, the sperm is abundant, practically infinite in supply and biologically less costly to produce than eggs. A quick rule of thumb in biology, which can explain a lot of sex differences in many species is that sperm is cheap and eggs are expensive. Yes, we say this all the time. Now, a second variable that builds on top of anisogamy is the internal gestation of fertilized eggs within the female body, right? Women carry the eggs, not the men. So among other things, as a result of this limitation, women can produce far fewer offspring than the man can. It takes a woman nine months, usually a few years to produce one child, um, before she's fertile again, because a woman is usually infertile while she nurses the baby. Uh, while for a man, it could take 15 minutes. 15 minutes, boom, he impregnated a girl, that's it. So a woman can normally have at most 20 to 25 pregnancies in her entire lifetime, and usually it's far less than that. But there's no limit to the number of children men could potentially produce. The operative term here is, of course, potentially. But the point is you see a gap. So the implications of these two things is this concept we call fitness variance. <laughs> Sorry about that. Wire got caught between my legs. Pop that shit out. So we're talking about fitness variance. So fitness variance is the difference between the winners and the losers in the reproductive game. That gap between those who are reproductively doing very well and those who are not doing reproductively well. For anyone in the master, this should sound very familiar and relatable as fuck. Now, because of anisogamy and internal gestation, men have much greater fitness variance than women. So the gap between winners and losers is much greater. So men's greater fitness variance implies two things. First, if we're looking at the bottom of the distribution, think sub fives, think incels, things like this far more men remain childless than women, whereas relatively fewer women remain childless for life. 
So one consequence of greater fitness variance among men is that the fitness floor, the worst possible outcome, reproductively speaking, for men is much lower for them than it is for women. The worst on average is much worse for men than it is for women. And this is reflected in the fact that, historically speaking, over the course of human history, women have reproduced more than men. Second, looking at the top of the distribution, the other side of the coin, think the, uh, you know, the chads, the high rollers, the bad boys, whatever you want to call them, fast life strategists, etc. A few men have far larger number of children than any woman could possibly have. And it's possible for some men to have dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of kids in their lifetime, if possible. Whereas a woman is limited, at most, to about 25 pregnancies in life. And this other consequence of greater fitness variance among women is the fitness ceiling. The best one can possibly do is much higher for men than for women. When we're talking reproductive success, men can produce more kids than women. Now, that being said, the closing thought here is that fitness variance is the distance between the ceiling and the floor, and that distance is much greater for men than it is for women. That is this, this fitness inequality, if you will. It's much more pronounced for men. So even though as anisogamy and internal gestation within the female body makes greater fitness variance among men than among women possible, what actually produces it in reality is the fact that humans are naturally polygynous. So, and that's reflected again in the numbers. For every one woman popping out a baby, there's a guy who had a nut. So if only, 80, let's say 80% of women reproduced and 40% of men reproduced historically, I think that's accurate. Um, what's that telling you? It's telling you that harems were kind of a thing, right? That's the implication of the fitness variance gap. Now, the implications also of this fitness variance, because the inequality is so immense in the dating market. It is this fitness variance rather than gender socialization, why men are more aggressive, why men are more competitive and violent than women. Men gain more by competing. While the competition for women to, to compete is far less, but women will compete for highly desirable men but for men in general, no, they generally won't. They're not going to compete for an average Joe on a balance of probabilities. But um, what you're also dealing with here is the possibility of competing effectively versus not competing effectively. If men compete successfully and gain reproductive access to a large number of women, they could potentially have hundreds if not thousands of kids. But if they fail, they end up with none. So the difference in reward for competition and cost of not competing is tremendous. So they might as well compete. That is the Savannah principal environment telling his Ooga Booga, you might as well. It takes a lot to go against that. All right. But building off of this, well, what about culture? Like you've been talking about all these biological impulses up until now. Does culture play any role in this at all? Because you haven't really said much about it. Well, our evolved mind does influence our behavior, as evolutionary psychologists would say. But what about culture, which is what the social scientists would be more interested in? Surely this influences and molds human behavior through cultural socialization, as traditional sociologists say, even to a greater extent than our innate tendencies do. And an evolutionary psychologist would say, yes, these things matter to an extent. But the grave error of the sociologist in the traditional sense and others under the influence of this standard social science model is to believe that human behavior is infinitely malleable, capable of being molded and shaped limitlessly in any way by cultural practices and socialization. But available evidence now shows that this view is false. Human behavior, while malleable within the realm of the genetic wheelhouse, is not infinitely malleable by culture because culture is not infinitely variable. In fact, Despite all the surface and minor differences, evolutionary psychologists have shown all human cultures to be more or less the same. So some of you might be thinking, knee-jerk reaction to that, no way. They, they, they can't be the same. Uh, they, they have to be different. 
But consider some ideas here, right? The idea that yes, some cultures think, hey, don't eat pig, while some cultures think, hey, don't eat cow. But they share the common idea that you have to have protein intake. There's also the idea of languages. They're spoken differently, of course. But they all have a similar structure, right? There's grammar to these languages. And even in the absence of being exposed to any of these languages, a kid will develop their own language, and that language will also have its own structure and grammar and things like this. So the propensity to build a language with structure and grammar and things like this, that's the universal. But how that universal expresses itself is different. English, Russian, French, Japanese, Mandarin, Cantonese, etc., etc. So there was a man by the name of Pierre Vandenberg who says that culture is the uniquely human way of adapting, but culture too evolved biologically. So, for example, the idea of having languages with structure and grammar, there was a positive adaptation tied to that. And that's why we have languages that develop the way they do. Okay? Now, that's pretty much chapter two. And as you can see, we're already pretty deep in, and we're only on chapter three. I warned you guys. <laughs> we're going to talk about Barbie, manufactured by Mattel, designed by evolution. The evolutionary psychology of sex and mating. Right. Now, you may believe that your personal preferences for an ideal mate are truly personal and individual, not shared by other people. But evolutionary psychology says that, contrary to what you think, your preferences and desires for your, your, preferences and desires for your ideal mate are strongly shaped by the forces of evolution. Right, you're wired to want what you want. So this raises the first question. Why do men like blonde bombshells? And why do women want to look like them? So this is a fairly good question. Why, why do America's sweethearts, like why, why do we want them? Now it's commonly believed by those who subscribe to the standard social science model, in other words, that everybody except for evolutionary psychologists believes that the media imposes arbitrary images of ideal female beauty on girls and women in our society and force them to aspire to these artificial and arbitrary standards. According to this claim, girls and women want to look like supermodels or actresses or pop idols because they are bombarded with images of these women. By implication, according to this view, girls and women will cease to want to look like them if the media would cease inundating them with such images or else change the arbitrary standards of female beauty. Sure, just do a bunch of plus-size body positivity and all of a sudden men will start getting boners to that. It has been made abundantly clear that that is not the case. That is not what will happen. And this seems to imply that there's something else here. It is not socialization. That isn't to say that socialization plays no role in attraction. We are not saying that. But what we are saying is that the Ooga Booga plays a lot more of a role than we care to admit. So, let's continue. The author presents two pieces of evidence that are sufficient to kind of illustrate the point. Long before there was media, long before there was internet and all this stuff, about a half a millennium, possibly two millennia ago, there were women dyeing their hair blonde. Why? There was no media imposing that, and yet they were doing this. And at the same time, we have a recent study from women in Iran where they are generally not exposed to the Western media and culture. So, obviously, the mate guarding is very strong in the Middle Eastern world. And they're not exposed to Western media and influence so they wouldn't know Jessica Simpson. They wouldn't know Roseanne Barr and the difference between those two. And these women are covered up most of the time, right? They wear the traditional Muslim hijab. And they cover their entire body sometimes to make it impossible to tell what shape it is. And yet these women are more concerned with their body image and want to lose more weight than their American counterparts in the land of Vogue and the Barbie doll, where supposedly these standards are imposed. So the standard social science model basically can't address this. So again, why do women want to look like bombshells? Evolutionary psychology suggests that it's because men want to mate with women who look like them. 
So if you want reproductive success, you need to be attuned to that as a woman. Women's desire to look like them is a direct, realistic, and sensible response to the desire of men. But this then raises the question, why do men want to mate with women who look like this? Well, because women who look like this have higher reproductive value and fertility and attain greater reproductive success on average. There's nothing arbitrary about the image of ideal female beauty. It has been precisely and carefully calculated by millions of years of evolution. So men today, they want to mate with women who look like these bombshells. And as a result, women want to look like them because our ancestral men who did not want to mate with women who didn't look like them um, made it so. And men who did want to mate with women who didn't look like this, clearly their influence is not shown in modern society. But what are the features, right? In terms of physical appearance, bombshells, what do they have? What are men looking for here? Well, youth is obvious, right? Men prefer young women because they have a greater reproductive value and fertility than older women. They're early on in their, let's call it reproductive careers, which means there's a lot of potential to provide young, healthy um, offspring that don't have any defects and things like this. So if a man is looking for a healthy woman to have children with, to ensure survival of his genes, he is interested in youth because it's probably the most obvious indicator of health, right? So that's the first one. Now, the second thing is this idea of long hair, right? Men in general prefer women with long hair and most young women choose to grow their hair long. So men's preference for women with long hair is probably the reason for women's preference to grow their hair long. But why? Again, why is this the case? We're trying to go back to the Ooga Booga environment where we have limited tools and ways to assess health and things like this. So why does long hair indicate anything? Hmm. So if we're going to consider the fact that a woman is responsible for carrying the child, nursing the child, and things like this, the woman's health is obviously essential for the well-being of the child. So women who are sick, obviously, probably wouldn't make good moms. So men naturally are interested in selecting women who have the appearance of healthiness to be the mothers of their children. So how do you assess this? Well, they had to judge women's health by themselves. And one accurate indicator um, is women's hair, the condition of the hair. So healthy people have lustrous, shiny hair. Whereas sickly people lose its luster, it falls out, things like this. And uh, during illness, a body needs to sequester all available nutrients like iron and protein to fight the illness. So since hair is not essential to survival, hair is the first place to which the body turns to collect the necessary nutrients. Thus, a person's poor health first shows up in the condition of hair. So obviously a woman with clumps of hair falling out of her head and shit like this, this might have indicated to the man, okay, she doesn't have full luscious hair. Health might be a concern. This is how an ancestral male would have thought when assessing this. The next one is small waist. Bombshells have this in common, this 36, 24, 36 ratio. 36, 24, 36. The hourglass figure. And it's not arbitrary. So we have an evolutionary psychologist at the University of Texas, Devendra Singh, who conducted experiments in different societies to demonstrate that men have a universal preference for low waist to hip ratios. So 0.7, which is essentially the 36, 24, 36, and then the one, which is like the one to one ratio, most men in Singh's experiment preferred the 0.7, the hourglass. Okay. And one of the authors actually replicated this experiment in three different countries on three different continents, the U.S., New Zealand, and the U.K., and found the same results. So most men prefer women with 0.7 waist-to-hip ratio, and most women prefer men with a 0.9 waist-to-hip ratio, which means that the, um, the waist is slightly less than the hip. It's kind of like that inverted triangle look that women like. So... That doesn't answer the question, though, why men want this. Well, Singh argues that it's because healthy women have lower waist-to-hip ratios than unhealthy women. And a host of diseases like diabetes, hypertension, heart attack, stroke, and gallbladder disorders 
often the presence of such things can be reflected in the distribution of body fat in women. So obviously if the distribution is off, that could be an indicator to a man that, hey, this woman's not healthy. So because that's the case, um, this could indicate to a man, hey, steer clear. But a woman with a lower waist to hip ratio, they tend to be more fertile. Uh, they have an easier time conceiving a kid. And they do so at earlier ages because they have larger amounts of essential reproductive hormones. And of course, women who are already pregnant with another man's child, which by necessity would redistribute the fat, they can't maintain that, which tells the man, hey, hey, this woman's already pregnant. Stay away. So the female waist to hip ratio also fluctuates, albeit very slightly, over the menstrual cycle. It becomes the lowest during ovulation when the woman is fertile. Thus, men are unconsciously seeking healthier and more fertile women when they seek women with small waists. Now, the next one was a bit of a mystery for a while, right? We've so far talked about why men like youth, why men like women with long, full heads of hair, why men like women with small um, hip-to-waist ratios or waist-to-hip ratios. What about boobs? Why boobs, right? So the idea of large boobs, the size of a woman's breasts has nothing to do with her ability to lactate. Small breasts can do it, large breasts can do it. So women with large breasts do not necessarily make better mothers than women with small breasts. So why then do men prefer women with large breasts? There was no satisfactory answer until recently. So there was a Harvard anthropologist, Frank Marlowe. He suggested a solution to this puzzle in the late 1990s, although with the hindsight, it is another mystery why nobody else thought of the idea sooner. So he makes the simple observation that larger and hence heavier breasts sag more conspicuously with age than smaller ones. Thus, it's easier for men to judge a woman's age and by extension, her fertility and reproductive value by sight if she has larger breasts than if she has smaller breasts because younger women tend to have perkier boobs. Older ones tend to not. So again, when you're limited by the ancestral environment, the yoga booga, this is what you have to work with. But there is a competing evolutionary psychological explanation for why men prefer women with large breasts. A study of Polish women shows that women who simultaneously have large breasts and a tight waist have the greatest uh, fertility. So men may prefer women with large breasts for the same reasons they prefer women with small waists. But this is further evidence that it's necessary to evaluate which of these two competing explanations is more accurate. It's probably a blend of both, if I had to guess, because you can't exactly see hormones with your eyes, but you can see an indicator of hormones or lack thereof with perky or saggy boobs. But this is one of many areas in evolutionary psychology where there are competing hypotheses, which is just a sign of healthy science. It's okay to not have all the answers. Now, the next one is very interesting, right? Blonde hair. And specifically, blonde hair evolving in places like Scandinavia and shit like this, right? Why do men like blonde hair? Why do they like blondes? So there is evidence that women during the Roman era and the Renaissance period dyed their hair blonde long before the discovery of peroxide in 1812. And women desired to be blonde so strongly throughout recorded history that they accomplished it without the aid of peroxide. And some believe that men prefer blonde hair because blonde women tend to have lighter skin, which they prefer, but this seems to be false. While men do prefer women with lighter skin color because it is an indication of higher fertility, a woman's skin color darkens when she is pregnant or on the pill. The lightest skin color is associated with red hair, not blonde hair. Yet, according to one study, both men and women have extreme aversion to potential mates with red hair. Gingers have no souls. Sorry, folks, I have no soul. Turns out that men prefer blonde hair for exactly the same reason that they prefer large breasts. Both are accurate indicators of a woman's age and thus reproductive value. Well, what the fuck does that mean? Well, what distinguishes blonde hair from all other hair colors? Well, it changes dramatically with age. Young girls with light blonde hair usually grow up to be women with brown hair. And as a guy who had blonde hair as a, as a boy, it did eventually turn brown, and now it's become gingerish. Like the tint in my beard is now tinted in my hair. 
very strange how that development occurred. Um, but that's just sort of, yeah, I, I can vouch for that, that your hair changes color when you start off with light blonde as you age. So if men prefer to mate with women with blonde hair, they're unconsciously attempting to mate with younger and hence on average healthier and more fertile women with greater reproductive value and fertility. So it's no coincidence that blonde hair evolved in Scandinavia and Northern Europe where it's very cold. In Africa, where our ancestors evolved for most of their evolutionary history, people mostly stayed naked, which means you could look at other things like boobs and, you know, um, waist to hip ratio. You could look at all that. But if you're all bundled up because it's fucking cold, you need another way. It's kind of the idea. And blonde hair is one of those ways to determine youth and therefore health. And then the last thing, I think this was the last indicator. They talked about blue eyes, right? So why would blue eyes be an attractive thing? The attraction of blue eyes remained an evolutionary mystery until an undergraduate student, Leanne Turney, suggested a novel solution in her term paper for a class that she took from one of the authors, Kanazawa, in spring 2002. So as far as we know, hers is the only available explanation for attraction of blue eyes that anyone has ever proposed, and it at least has some surface plausibility, but got to replicate it. Don't know if any studies have been done to confirm it, but Turney points out this idea that human pupils dilate when an individual is exposed to something that he or she likes. We talk about this in the choosing signals video. When you're talking to a woman, if her pupils are dilated, that's a good sign, right? But the pupils of women and infants, but not men, spontaneously dilate when they see babies. Thus, pupil dilation, which is usually beyond an individual's conscious volitional control, can be used as an honest indicator of interest and attraction. Most people are not even aware that the size of their pupils changes when they see something they like, so it would be difficult to deceive others by consciously manipulating their pupil size. Uh, but in modern times, you know, you have prostitutes with like eye drops where they could do that and dilate their pupils artificially um, to, again, simulate um, attraction when there is none. But Turney makes two simple observations about this from the, you know, savanna environment type perspective. Every human pupil is dark brown, regardless of color of the iris, which surrounds it. So blue is the lightest color of the human iris. The consequence of these two observations is that the size of the pupil is easiest to determine in blue eyes. If you face people with different eye colors and must determine whether each person likes or is interested in you, with all else equal, it is easiest to read the blue-eyed person's level of interest or attraction. So, blue-eyed people are considered attractive as potential mates because it's easy to determine whether they are interested in us or not. Again, remember, when we're in the dating and mating game, we're looking for efficiency, and on a subconscious level, our brain is doing this. We want to have the easiest, most efficient way to acquire mates that have what we want and indicate to us that they are fertile, healthy, and ideally um, fit to be mothers. So obviously, being able to detect a person's interest in you by seeing dilated pupils, that could be an advantage, okay? And it also could explain why people with dark brown eyes are often considered to be mysterious. They're mysterious because their minds, that is whether or not they're interested in or attracted to us, are more difficult to assess. The color of the dark brown iris is very similar to the pupil, and so it is very difficult to gauge the size of the pupil in dark brown eyes. And many people, both men and women, express dislike for extremely dark brown eyes as a result. But here's the thing. Despite everything that was shaped in the Ooga Booga, men are still fooled, right? Because here's the thing. Women can now get boob jobs, they have hair dye, color contact lenses. Many of these features that normally would indicate youth, fertility, health, it could be manipulated now with modern science. So men fall for it naturally because the brain cannot really comprehend concepts like hair dye and silicone breasts because we did not evolve in an environment designed to deal with that level of nuance. So men can cognitively, you know, human level brain, not mammalian and less so reptilian, they can understand that many blonde women with firm large breasts are not actually young. 
but they still find them attractive because their evolved psychological mechanisms are fooled by the modern inventions that did not exist in the ancestral environment. Okay? The next question that's asked is, why is beauty not in the eye of the beholder or skin deep? Right? So why is there objective attraction standards? So the social science model would probably say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder which means that different people possess different standards of beauty and that not everyone agrees on who is beautiful and who is not and that it's skin deep, which means that there are no real differences between attractive and unattractive people besides their looks. So both of these sayings make perfect sense from the perspective of this model. Humans are born with blank slates for minds. The logic goes everything, including taste for standards of beauty, must be acquired after birth through socialization. But evolutionary psychology and the research they do has overturned this common assumption and widespread belief. The standards of beauty are universal, both across individuals in a single culture and across all cultures. Okay, so within the United States, both East Asian and white individuals and white and black individuals agree on which faces are more or less attractive. Cross-culturally, there is considerable agreement in the judgment of beauty among East Asians, Hispanics, and Americans, Brazilians, Americans, Russians, the Ake of Paraguay and the Hiwi of Venezuela, the Cruzans and Americans in Saint Croix, white South Africans and Americans, and the Chinese Indians and the English. In none of these studies does the degree of exposure to Western media have any influence on people's perception of beauty. So exposure to the, the overbearing standards of beauty or lack thereof doesn't seem to influence anything. If anything, these overbearing standards of beauty in the media are just a reflection of what is already innate within us. So two studies conducted in the mid-1980s independently demonstrate that infants as young as two and three months old gaze longer at a face that adults judge to be more attractive than at a face that they judge to be unattractive, indicating infants' preferences for attractive faces. This is a brutal black pill we talk about sometimes. And newborn babies less than one week old show significantly greater preference for faces that adults judge to be attractive. Infants also showed more observable pleasure in masks of attractive faces versus unattractive masks, and they played with attractive dolls versus unattractive dolls. So it seems to indicate that it is not a product of socialization because we can agree that you cannot socialize an infant that quickly, which means something else is at play. So beauty is in the adaptations of the beholder. But why are the standards of beauty innate? Again, it always comes back to the why. Why are we born with a common general perception as to who is beautiful and who is not? So there's a few features that characterize physically attractive faces. Bilateral symmetry, averageness, and secondary sexual characteristics. Attractive faces are more symmetrical than unattractive faces. Bilateral symmetry, the extent to which the facial features on the left and the right side of the faces are identical. So bilateral symmetry is an indicator that there is less exposure to parasites, pathogens, and toxins during development. And with genetic disruptions such as mutations and inbreeding, um, obviously, that's a problem. So developmentally and genetically, healthy individuals have greater symmetry in their facial and body features and thus are more attractive. So there's a positive correlation between parasite and pathogen prevalence in the environment and the importance placed on physical attractiveness in mate selection. So obviously when there are threats to health, the importance on the indicators of that health become more important, which makes sense. Now facial averageness is another feature that increases physical attractiveness. Faces with features closer to the population average are more attractive than those with extreme features. So in memorable words of Judith H. Langlois, attractive faces are only average. Evolutionary psychological reasons for why average faces in the population are more attractive than extreme faces are not as clear as the reasons for why facial symmetry is attractive. Current speculation is that I need a new wire, man. <laughs> Current speculation is that facial averageness results from the heterogeneity rather than the homogeneity of genes. 
individuals who have two different copies or alleles of a gene are more resistant to a larger number of parasites, less likely to have two copies of deleterious genes, and at the same time, more likely to have statistically more average faces with less extreme features. So if this speculation is correct, it means that just like bilateral symmetry, facial averageness is an indicator of genetic health and parasite resistance. Yes. Again, if it looks pretty run-of-the-mill, nothing's wrong with it. This is kind of the average look that's passed on from generation to generation and survived successfully. Yeah. Beauty appears to be an indicator of genetic and developmental health. And therefore, the mate quality beauty is a health certification. Very interesting. Next question is, why is prostitution the world's oldest profession and why is pornography a billion dollar industry? So it has often been remarked that female prostitutes cater to men while male prostitutes also cater to men. Gay or straight, virtually all clients of prostitution are men. And very few women contract the service of prostitutes. So why the sex difference and why is prostitution the world's oldest profession? Libido gap. Men's reproductive success is primarily constrained by the number of women to whom they have sexual access. Whereas women's does not increase linearly with the number of men to whom they have sexual access. For example, if a man has sex with 1,000 women in a year, he could potentially produce 1,000 children and realistically about 30 in a year. Now, in sharp contrast, if a woman has sex with 1,000 men in a year, she can only have one child barring a multiple birth in the same period, which she can achieve by having regular sex only with one man. So the probability of conception if a woman has sex with one man 100 times is 0.95. So unlike for men, there is very little reproductive benefit for women in seeking out a large number of sex partners. But again, this makes sense in the Ookabooga. In the modern times, we have things like birth control and stuff like this, the oofy doofy, that kind of flips things on its head. But from the perspective of an ancestral environment, men are selected to desire a far larger number of sexual partners than women do, sowing their oats, so to speak. And on average, young men profess to desire about eight different sexual partners in two years, whereas young women profess to desire only about one in the same period. And this is why men desire sexual variety, sexual intercourse with a large number of partners to a far greater extent than women do. Prostitution, the world's oldest profession, is simply a consequence of men's evolved desire for sexual variety. It is quite literally a reflection of the libido gap and catering to that libido gap via the world's oldest business model. Okay. And an overwhelming majority of consumers of porn is also men. So given the greater desire for sexual variety, it's understandable why men would consume so much of this stuff and seek out encounters with numerous women in photographs and videos, as they do when they contract prostitutes in search of greater variety. But unlike consorting with prostitutes, it's not actual sexual intercourse. But the Savannah principle would dictate that the ancestral environment and how it shaped us can't understand that nuance. It cannot distinguish. So when you're looking at pictures and videos, you can't comprehend that it's not real, truly, on a subconscious level. Sure, cognitively, you can appreciate the difference. But every single naked and sexually receptive woman that our male ancestors saw was a potential sex partner. As a result, their brains think that they might have actual encounters with these women. So it's very hard to kind of turn that on its head and really understand intuitively I'm never going to have sex with these women. These women are never going to want me. They don't give a fuck about me. So I should not be looking to invest in them sexually or otherwise. It takes a lot to go against that. But why else would men have an erection when they view pornographic material, when the only biological function of an erection is allow men to have sex? So if men's brains could truly comprehend at the subconscious level that they would never have sex with these women, they would not get an erection when they watch it. And yet you do get it. So by comparison, when we you know, flip the script, women do not seek variety because their reproductive success does not increase by having sex with a large number of partners. Men's does. So in fact, given the limited number of children they can have in their lifetimes, the potential cost of having it with the wrong partner is far greater for women than it is for men. If a man has sex with a, you know, a crappy mate, he could just walk away. If a woman has sex with a crappy mate and gets pregnant, She's stuck with that kid. So this is why women are far more cautious about having sex with someone they do not know well. Women takes about six months to kind of figure out, you know, if they actually want to, while for men, they can figure it out in like a week. 
That seems to be the average. Though after the advent of social media and things like this, you know, which was came out after this book, times have changed. Now the next point, why Sean Connery and Catherine Zeta-Jones, but not Lauren Bacall and Brad Pitt. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but the idea essentially is that there are age differences between men and women. And the man tends to be a lot older than the woman. Sorry, my neighbor's mowing the lawn. But the man tends to be a lot older than the woman in these age gap couples. It's not really the other way around. So now you're probably wondering, well, why is that? Well, it's obvious. The obvious ring is that this men look for youth in women because youth is a mark of health. It's a mark of fertility and things like this. So if a man has a vested interest in passing on his genes, he wants youth. Women, on the other hand, they're like, okay, fair enough. You want to pass on your genes. That's cool. But do you have the resources to pony up to support this shit? Do you have that? You either do or you do not. If you do not, then she's not going to want to mate with you. So older men tend to be more established. They tend to be more experienced. They tend to have the resources and means to actually provide. So women look at that and they go, okay, maybe it makes more sense to be with a guy who has this than to be with some young nobody who has nothing. And that's the basic gist of that. Okay, with coffee refilled, I'm ready to continue. So, the last question of this chapter is, why do men and women perceive the same situation differently? Right? So one of the classic running jokes of relations between men and women is miscommunication and misunderstanding. Right? It's been in sitcoms, it's been in novels, it's been in film. So, a man and woman encounter each other and have a pleasant and friendly conversation. This is the common example. And the man is thinking that she is romantically and sexually attracted to him, while the woman is entertaining no such thought. She's simply being nice. Whether you're male or female, you can probably think of a real situation in your life that involved this type of miscommunication with someone of the opposite sex. Absolutely. So... Here's what they did to sort of confirm this. In a laboratory experiment, a male and female participant engaged in five-minute conversation while unbeknownst to both participants. A male and a female observer watched the entire interaction. After the interaction, both the male participant and the male observer rate the female participant as being more promiscuous and seductive than do the female participant or female observer. Male participants report being more sexually attracted to their conversation partner than do female participants. So men and women can engage in or observe the same situation, but men perceive greater likelihood of sexual relationship than women do. Again, this is a function of the libido and desire gap. The reality of life, and I think it'll be easier for you as a man if you internalize this now, very easily. On average, most men want most women. On average, most women do not want most men. There are men that women do want, but it is not most men. There are women men do not want, but that is not most women. When you understand that, a rejection is just a Tuesday. If you understand how the, the laws of physics, if you will, of this type of shit works, then you understand that a rejection is not something that should be taken personally because the reality is it just is because of this type of shit. So, the failure to recognize this pervasive sex difference in cognitive biases can lead to costly mistakes, not only for individuals, but for corporations and society alike. So, there was a supermarket called Safeway, where everyone basically was told by the company, hey, you need to look the person in the eye, say thank you, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so for shopping at Safeway and smile and retain eye contact. And when a male looked at a male, no problem. When a female looked at a female, no problem. When a male looked at a female, no problem. But when a female looked at a male, again, Ooga Booga can't comprehend this shit. So he assumes that she's sexually interested in him and then harassment and things like this followed. And then they had to discontinue the policy. So why do these problems happen? Well, Men are more likely to infer sexual interest in a neutral encounter than women are. And two evolutionary psychologists, Marty Hazelton and David Buss, which that name should be very familiar to you all, 
they offer an explanation of what's called error management theory. So what is that? Well, natural and sexual selection should then favor the evolution of inference systems and minimize the total cost of errors rather than their total numbers. So what does that mean? For instance, if a man must infer the sexual interest of a woman whom he encounters, he can make two types of errors, right? He can infer that she is sexually interested when she's not, which is a false positive, or he can infer that she is not interested when she is, which is a false negative. So that's actually what I tend to do. But uh, I consciously go out of my way to assume the false negative scenario. And I can tell you from experience the consequences of these things. So let's go. What are the consequences of each type of error? So the consequence of a false positive, thinking that she is interested when she's not, is that he'd be turned down, maybe laughed at, possibly slapped in the face. Okay, in retrospect, yeah, it kind of sucks, but whatever. The consequence of a false negative, thinking that she is not interested when she is, is a missed opportunity for sexual intercourse and to increase his reproductive success. So again, from the ancestral environment perspective, in the absence of modern oofy doofy, the latter cost is far greater than the former. Thus, men should be selected to possess a cognitive bias that constantly leads them to overestimate a woman's sexual interest. Or at the very least, such genes are not so deleterious that natural selection would have filled them out. So, it doesn't just explain previously known phenomena, such as the results of the lab experiment we talked about, but it leads to two other predictions. First, women should underestimate a man's romantic commitment to them because the cost of a false positive, thinking that a man is romantically committed to her when he is not getting pregnant by him and then having him desert her, is far greater than the cost of a false negative, thinking that he is not romantically committed to her when he is and missing an opportunity to form a committed romantic relationship. Granted, oofy doofy, modern government social safety nets mitigate this, right? So that's why a woman can go and fuck around with a guy that she knows isn't going to commit to him and if she gets knocked up, eh, don't worry, single taxpayers will take care of her. But again, this did not exist in the ancestral environment. So she's still wired to kind of avoid that. And maybe this is why a lot of these one-night stands happen when people are fucking hammered to kind of tell their evolutionary instincts to shut the fuck up. Maybe. But if a woman misses an opportunity to form a long-term committed relationship with one man, the reality is libido and desire gap, she can soon get an opportunity to form one with another man. In contrast, one mistake with a wrong man can burden the woman with a child and ruin her future romantic prospects for many years to come. We talk about this all the time. Single moms, men do not want to raise the kids of other men. They don't want to do that. Second, the tendency of men to overestimate a woman's sexual interest should not apply to their sister's interest in other men because men need to perceive their sister's sexual interest in other men accurately so that they can protect them from unwelcome advances from those they are not interested in. In other words, the cognitive bias of men to overestimate women's sexual interest is not blind or unqualified. It is only activated in encounters with women with whom they might conceivably have sex. Which, you know, unless you're, you're hanging out in tar nation, <laughs> that excludes the sisters, okay? And the studies done by Hazleton and Buss seem to confirm both of these predictions, okay? So men and women don't really understand each other, and that's kind of like the running joke is that men sort of like overestimate, like, oh, you know, this girl's enjoying, I'm enjoying the conversation with this girl. Oh, she must really like me. While women are kind of doing the opposite. Like, ah, you know, I'm just being nice. You know, I'm not expecting any commitment or anything because if I expect commitment and don't get it and then I fuck around with this guy under that pretense, yeah, the cost could be much higher for me than for him. Again, it's all happening in the backdrop. And that's pretty much it for chapter three. Got a lot to go and we're pretty deep in, like I said. Moving on to chapter four, go together like a horse and carriage, the evolutionary psychology of marriage, Right. So you can't talk about sex without talking about relationships. And I guess in terms of the enforced monogamy era, uh, marriage, right? So because marriage is closely related to sex and mating, it's another area where evolutionary psychology has produced a large number of fascinating studies. Okay. Um, and the most fascinating things to talk about here, of course, um, are about polygyny in particular, as well as monogamy. So despite the impression you might get from the history of Western civilization in the last millennium, which is pales in comparison 
um, to the human history in general. Humans are naturally polygynous, not monogamous. And as a result, all human societies, including the United States, are polygynous to various degrees. And we are seeing that today. We are seeing handfuls of men monopolize on the dating market and clean up. The characteristics of those men is irrelevant. The point is that there are men at the top cleaning up. Now, second, contrary to what you might think, most women benefit from polygyny, while conversely, most men benefit from monogamy. Because the idea is that, hey, you know, a woman would rather share the resources of a man who is valuable than be with a loser, financially speaking. The economically unattractive, we talk about this as well, all the time. While for men, obviously, if they do, under monogamy, every man kind of has a fair shot at having skin in the game. But if polygyny reigns supreme, a lot of men get left out, and then they have no skin in the game, which is bad for reproductive success. Now, what we are interested in when talking about the questions that we seek to answer here, one of the questions that originally got me to end up reading this book is, why are there virtually no polyandrous societies? For those who don't know, polygamy is the general idea of just one person having multiple spouses. But if you want to really delineate, Polygyny is when men have multiple wives. Polyandry is when women have multiple husbands. So a comprehensive survey of traditional societies in the world, that is not westernized societies, traditional societies, more eastern societies. It shows that 83.39% of them practice polygyny. That is, it's practiced. 16.4% practice monogamy, but only 0.47% practice polyandry. So almost all of the few polyandrous societies practice what anthropologists call fraternal polyandry, which is where the wife is shared by brothers. So why might this be the case, right? Well, as we discussed previously on this channel, paternity certainty is a big thing. And, you know, with a monogamous marriage, I mean, especially in the ancestral environment, you're already uncertain as is. The woman is supposed to be mating with only one man, but we actually have numbers of the estimated cuckoldry in Western societies in particular. Across the entire globe, it's about 4%. But in Western societies, we have a pretty good idea now. In monogamous societies, we have in the United States approximately 13 to 20% rate of paternity fraud. In Mexico, it's 10 to 14%, and in Germany, it's 9 to 17%, which from Germany, you might be able to extrapolate other European countries being similar-ish to that. And Canada, I would say, is probably somewhere between Mexico and the United States, right? So when multiple men are officially married to one woman, who is supposed to mate with all of them, the co-husbands have very little reason to believe that a given child of hers is genetically his and will therefore not be very motivated to invest in it. This is definitely the case if you have a um, non-fraternal polyandrous relationship. But when you compare that to fraternal polyandry, the co-husbands are brothers, which means that if it is his kid, half the genes are his. If it's the uncle's, if the guy is the uncle, then one fourth is still his, which means that, you know, there's a genetic link there. So they might be more inclined so if polyandry is to work in any sense long term, it seems to be uh, fraternal polyandry, but it's still not that common. But by the same token, the most successful type of polygyny is sororal polygyny, where the co-wives are sisters. Although unlike non-fraternal po polyandry, non-sororal polygyny is very common. And while a woman, when given a choice between marrying an unmarried man and marrying a married man, might under some circumstances rationally choose to marry polygynously, um, it is never in the existing wife's material interest for her husband to acquire another wife because every senior wife who is already married to the man suffers from the addition of a new wife because each wife takes the, away the husband's resources that could have been allocated to her and her offspring. So conflict among co-wives is common. And for this reason, men tend to have these families, these wives in different households to keep them separate but it doesn't change the fact that there's still a limitation on resources. Which is why in cultures that practice polygyny, they say, hey, listen, you want to have multiple wives, that's cool, but you better provide for them. 
you better have the means to actually take that on. I would say most men are not able to do that, but those who are, yeah. So the next thing that we um, are going to highlight here is this idea of female promiscuity as a subset of this question. So human females have been promiscuous throughout their evolutionary history, but the question, of course, is how promiscuous? Promiscuity isn't exactly an unheard of thing. But it turns out we can measure the degree of female promiscuity rather precisely by the relative size of testes on the male body. Okay, interesting, that's a bit of a leap, but okay, let's hear it out. Across species, the more promiscuous the females are, the larger the size of the testes relative to the male's body weight. This is because when a female copulates with multiple males within a short period of time, um, sperm from different males must compete with each other to reach the egg to inseminate it. One good way to outcompete is to outnumber them, have more sperm. So the evidence of women's promiscuity throughout evolutionary history is in the relative size of men's testicles. Men who have not, who would not have such large testicles and produce so much sperm, had women, they wouldn't have it if women weren't so promiscuous. But when you compare this to, you know, gorillas who have very small testes by comparison, and then chimpanzees who have larger, it shows that humans are somewhere in the middle, closer to the gorilla side. So there seems to be some mild promiscuity going on here. And another biopsychologist, Gordon Gallup, says that the shape of the male shaft also plays a role. The shape of it seems to imply that it kind of is a, um, how did they word it? They worded it as a semen displacement device. Like basically from the thrusting motion, it can go in and scoop out. It's nasty as fuck, I know. But it makes sense, right? You're going in and you're getting out the competing stuff in favor of your own. It kind of makes sense why it's like that. But again, the fact that such a mechanism had to evolve is an indicator that promiscuity on some level was present. And that's why, po um, not polyandry, why promiscuity is still prevalent even today. Why infidelity is still an issue today. It is remnants of the ancestral environment. Moving on to the next question. Why and how are contemporary Westerners polygynous? So polyandry is very rare in human society. We've outlined this already. And that means that almost all human societies practice either monogamy or polygyny. That's nothing new. Now, even though those of us in Western industrial societies tend to think of monogamy as both natural and normal, um, monogamous societies seem to be a small minority throughout the world. And the question is, well, why is this? It's because contrary to the religious beliefs, humans are naturally polygynous. By naturally, we mean that humans have been polygynous throughout most of their evolutionary history. Strict and socially imposed monogamy is a recent invention in human evolutionary history. It's evolutionary novel. So it turns out that clear evidence of our ancestors' polygyny is embodied in each of us, both among primate and non-primate species. The species' typical degree of polygyny highly correlates with the degree of sexual dimorphism in size. So the more polygynous the species, the greater the size disparity between the sexes. For example, among the completely monogamous gibbons, there is no sexual dimorphism in size. Both by height and by weight, males are about the same size as females. In contrast, the extremely polygynous gorillas, males are 1.3 times as large as height and twice as large as weight as females. So humans are somewhere in the middle, but closer to the gibbons end than the gorillas. Human males are 1.1 times as large by height and 1.2 times as large by weight as human females. This suggests that we were mildly polygynous. By comparison, not as polygynous as gorillas, but not as monogamous as gibbons. So the first more established theory that would explain this is that males have become larger throughout evolutionary history, while the second newer one is that women have become smaller. So this raises the question, well, did men become bigger? Well, the proponents of the first theory point out that relative to monogamy, polygyny creates greater fitness variance, the distance between the winners and the losers. Yes, because it allows for more inequality to uh, manifest, while monogamy obviously enforces the opposite. So the greater fitness variance among males creates greater pressure for men to compete with each other for mates. And under such severe physical competition, only big and tall males can emerge victorious, which is the black pill concept. Height matters. And the theory assumes that tall men married to short women have tall sons but short daughters. 
but there are critics of this, obviously, because it doesn't make sense. Uh, the critics use to finish data on twins to demonstrate that this assumption is false, right? The data shows that sons are just as likely to inherit their height from mothers as from fathers and vice versa. So a tall father will have both tall sons and tall daughters, while a short mother will have both short sons and short daughters. So that leaves the other one. Did women become smaller? Well, under monogamy, most adult males are already married and cannot marry again. So there are no incentives for prepubescent girls to mature earlier. Prepubescent boys in their age group are in no position to marry them. And in contrast, under polygyny, married adult males can acquire additional wives. So girls who mature early on can become a junior wife of a wealthy village chief, while their prepubescent age mates cannot. Because girls who mature early attain smaller adult heights than girls who mature late throughout the world, because girls essentially stop growing when they reach puberty, this suggests that height differences between sexes should be greater in polygynous societies as a result of girls undergoing earlier puberty and becoming shorter. So what does the data say? Cross-cultural data shows that this is indeed the case. Girls in polygynous societies are far shorter than girls in monogamous societies, which seems to indicate that the women in the polygynous societies, they hit puberty sooner, so they stopped growing sooner, and therefore in the polygynous societies, women tend to be shorter and smaller while in the monogamous ones, they tend to grow for longer periods of time, and thus they tend to be taller on average, right? So, what we're talking about then is this idea that if you have a society with enforced monogamy, it's going to have an impact on height and size of people when the growth process stops for women. And it seems to show that really the size and height of men didn't really change much, irrespective of whether we're talking a polygynous or monogamous society, but the size of women did. And this seems to indicate that humans, evolutionarily speaking, given the height difference between men and women on average, have been historically polygynous. But if humans are naturally polygynous, why do humans practice monogamy? Why is that even a thing? Well, one theory suggests that's because that's what women want. In any species for which the female makes a greater investment in children than does the male, sex and mating is a female choice. Sex happens if and when the female wants it. The male doesn't really have a choice. And humans are not an exception to this. So monogamy emerges as an institution of marriage in the society when many or most women choose to marry monogamously. And polygyny similarly emerges as an institution of marriage when many or most women choose to marry polygynously. Or, if in the modern oofy doofy clown world, they choose career in favor of marriage, then nobody gets anything, really. So what, then, would lead women to choose to marry monogamously or polygynously? Well, resource inequality. If there's resource inequality, then it would make sense that women would go where the resources are, at the top. But if most men are kind of on equal footing-ish, it makes more sense that they would go monogamy. But here's the thing. An interesting wrinkle that came up is that women now have their own LMS. And because women have their own LMS and they're kind of taking on the role of men in this regard, most men are economically unattractive to them. So if a woman is going to be with a man, it has really less to do with his provision ability and more to do with how attracted she is to him. Another wrench thrown into it. But again, you can't take the ooga booga out of people. It just means that she reprioritizes what matters based on her circumstances. So the reason why most Western industrial societies are monogamous, despite the fact that humans are naturally polygynous, is that men in such societies tend to be more or less equal in their resources compared to their ancestors in medieval times. So it's elastic to that equality is essentially the point. Okay. But, you know, wealthy and powerful men throughout history, even while monogamously married, have always made it polygynously by having mistresses, concubines, and things like this. That's nothing new. But um, it's no secret that wealthier people tend to have more sex partners without having to enlist the services of prostitutes because women generally seek out high-value men. This is nothing new. And we also have to factor in that most monogamous societies allow people to get a divorce. And in many societies, such as the U.S., divorce is both very easy and very common. 
So men are also more likely to remarry after a divorce. Women are less likely to do so. Um, so because men are amassing more resources as they age and things like this, at least on paper, they become more desirable, at least from a provision perspective. But the problem is if that women have their own LMS, then this isn't really going to hold water anymore. Which again, this book was written before that. So that's a piece of the puzzle that he just could not have foreseen. But the core of it is this. When resource inequality is apparent, polygyny is more likely to occur. While when resource equality is more apparent, the story changes. So now the next thing is this. Why does having sons reduce the likelihood of divorce? So you have to understand that a man's mate value is largely determined by his wealth, status, and power. A woman's mate value is largely determined by her youth and physical attractiveness. Get angry? It is what it is. But if there is a son in the equation, the father has a vested interest and making sure his son inherits the wealth, status, and power so that his son could be reproductively successful. So, a daughter, however, her status, her wealth, her power, she can have those things, and her having those things will price her out of the market so that she's going to want a specific pool of men to commit to her monogamously, but those men obviously have the leverage, they're going to be polygynous. But that being said... Passing it on to the daughter doesn't really have a benefit for the daughter in the sense that, in fact, it could be a detriment, it could be argued, because it limits her pool. But it doesn't improve her mating success, her reproductive success. Her youth and beauty does. But for the son, it does make a huge difference. So continued presence of the father is important for the son, but not so much for the daughter. Strictly in reproductive terms we're talking here. Now, at the end of the day, having fathers in the lives of either is very important. But if we're talking about strictly reproductive success, the son being able to inherit the resources is obviously huge. And that's why it is less likely. Next is why are diamonds a girl's best friend? Right? So a woman has to be able to assess that a man is willing to invest in her, right? So how does a woman accomplish this task? How would she know which men will invest resources in her and her offspring? Well, from her perspective, a good dad versus the cad, who's kind of the fuck boy, has to possess two qualities. The ability to acquire and accumulate resources, of course, because how can you invest in a family if you don't do that? And the willingness to actually do so. Now, a good way to screen for men who are simultaneously able and willing to invest is to demand an expensive gift. We can call it gold digging, we can call it whatever it wants, but this is kind of their version of screening us. It's their counterpart to us screening, you know, their boobs, their waist to hip ratio and all this shit. So only men who are capable of acquiring resources and willing to invest can afford to give a woman expensive gifts, which are known as courtship gifts or uh, nuptial gifts in evolutionary biology. Yes, females of other species demand these gifts before they agree to have sex with the males. But would any expensive gifts do? Like a, like a car or a house? No. These gifts will not do. A man who is intrinsically interested in luxury European cars might buy her a Mercedes. A man who is intrinsically interested in real estate might buy her a house. In either case, his gift is not an unequivocal and pure indicator of his general and universal willingness to invest resources in her and her offspring. The courtship gift for the purposes of screening dads and cats must not be um, something like this. It has to lack intrinsic value, but also be costly. And diamonds, as a result, make a very excellent gift. Because diamonds don't really have intrinsic value, but they're very expensive. It really, same with flowers, right? Like bouquets. It offers no real intrinsic benefit to the man, and yet he still invests his resources in it for her. So she's, so evolutionarily speaking, her mind is going, if he's willing to do this then he must be willing to invest. And obviously, this seems to have been something that held true sufficiently long enough that it became part of the biological wiring. 
But the idea of a courtship gift is to spend money on something or spend resources on something that really doesn't have any value, but it, it is a heavy cost. Because if he's willing to make a heavy cost like that, then he is willing to, you know, put down um, the resources to invest in you and a family together. So that's kind of what we mean when we say, why are diamonds a woman's best friend? Now, the next question, and I think this might be the last question of this chapter, I think. Yes. Why might handsome men make bad husbands? Well, recall from earlier that beauty is not in the eye of the beholder or skin deep. We have two leading evolutionary psychologists, Stephen Gangestad and Jeffrey Simpson. They observe that men can maximize their reproductive success by pursuing one of two strategies. Seek a long-term mate, stay with her, and invest in their joint offspring. We call it the dad strategy. We call it the slow life strategy, the K strategy, or seek a large number of short-term mates without investing in any of the resulting offspring. This is the CAD strategy. This is the fast life strategy. This is the uh, R selection, right? These two strategies existing in tandem, we see it today. It's still there. It hasn't changed. Now, all men may, may, not necessarily, but may want to pursue the CAD strategy. They may want to, but their choice of the mating strategy is constrained by female choice. Sex does not happen unless the woman says it does. So men don't get to decide with whom they have sex. Women do. And women disproportionately seek out handsome men for their short-term mates for their good genes. So as you can see, remember, this was written in 2007. Even women who are already married would benefit from short-term mating with handsome men if they could successfully fool their husbands into investing in the resulting offspring. The women then get the best of both worlds. So their children carry the high-quality genes of their handsome lover and the parental investment of their unknowingly cuckolded but resourceful husband. This is the strategic pluralism that he's outlining here. But since then, we've acknowledged that the... Experiment of the smelly t-shirt couldn't be replicated. Can't replicate it means that whether or not the conclusions are valid, that comes into question. So now we have what's called the mate switching hypothesis, which means that if a woman could switch to what she perceives to be a superior mate, and on top of that, she could do it with minimal social blowback, she's going to do it. And there are a lot of government safety nets now, there are a lot of social safety nets now that enable this behavior. So... That is something that the ancestral environment could not predict, right? But when you look at that and you think about it in the abstract, if a single taxpayer's dollars pay for the mistakes of the woman in question, she has no reason to think that the blowback is going to be bad. Yet despite this, we see plenty of stories where wives are asking for open marriages. We see situations where women are going to affair partners. It doesn't work out because he's a cad and then she comes crawling back to the dad. Tons of stories like this. Yet for some reason, these social safety nets are perceived. So this could be an example of movie doofy socialization that makes them think that there actually is a better opportunity to mate switch when actually it doesn't exist. While people like Leonardo DiCaprio have been... <laughs> very effectively practicing mate switching for quite some time now, right? So that's just sort of something worth noting. But handsome men, they get a disproportionate number of opportunities for short-term mating, and as a result of this, they're less likely to commit. So they may not be a good catch, so to speak. They'd be a bad dad, but not a bad cat, while ugly men, by comparison, have no choice, right? So, because you're not sought out, you kind of have to deal with being the dad in that situation. The transactional beta bucks, we call it. And another study has shown that more attractive men have more short-term mates than long-term mates, while more attractive women have more long-term mates than short-term mates. Because women can call the shots on what they want when they have what men want. More important, handsome men invest less in their exclusive relationships than ugly men. They are less honest with and less attentive to their partners. Okay, but again, remember, we're not looking at any moral judgments here. It just is what it is. 
But when you think about it, it intuitively makes sense. The idea that, hey, man or woman, I've got what you want. I've got it. Which means if you enter my domain, you're playing by my rules. Nine times out of ten, that means that you're playing by the woman's rules because she has what you want and chances are, eh, you probably don't have what she wants. Right? But if you are the man that has what she wants, now the ball's in your court. So it kind of makes sense that obviously the women who have the most desirable traits can get the long-term relationships and the men who have the most desirable traits can get the short-term low commitment type situations. Yeah. And that's it for chapter four. Now we're going on to chapter five. So some things are more important than money, right? So this um, highlights the evolutionary psychology of the family. So family, parental investment, things like this are more important than money at the core. So one of the first questions that are asked in this chapter is, boy or girl, what influences the sex of your child? And um, it's commonly believed that whether or not you conceive a boy or girl is entirely up to chance. Close enough, but not quite. It's largely up to chance, but there's factors that very subtly influence the sex of an offspring. It's commonly believed that exactly half the babies born are boys and the other half are girls. Close enough, but not quite. Normal sex ratio is 0.5122, that is 105 boys for every 100 girls. So what factors affect this? Well, he starts by citing Robert L. Trivers. You have to talk about this guy, apparently, when talking about this topic. He has what's called the Trivers-Willard hypothesis, and it states that wealthy parents of high status have more sons, while poor parents of low status have more daughters. And it's because children generally inherit the wealth and status of their parents. So sons from wealthy families who themselves become wealthy have, throughout most of evolutionary history, been able to expect to have large numbers of wives, mistresses, concubines, etc. As a man, if you are resourceful, you have more sex options. So wealthy parents should bet on sons rather than daughters when passing on their legacy, of course. Conversely, poor sons can expect to be completely excluded from the reproductive game. And now we're at a point, because of Oofy Doofy, where average men are excluded from the game. Uh, because no women would choose them as their mates, because they're economically unattractive. But their equally poor sisters, because they're beautiful and young, if they are, can still expect to have some children if they are young and beautiful. Exactly. The fitness ceiling and the fitness floor. The fitness variance. Much wider for men. We're seeing it in real time. Now, there is evidence for this hypothesis throughout human societies. American presidents, vice presidents, and cabinet secretaries have more sons than daughters. Poor Mukogodo herders in East Asia have more daughters than sons, both at birth and in zero to four age group. Church parish records from the 17th and 18th centuries in Germany show that wealthy landowners had more sons than daughters, while farm laborers had more daughters than sons. Same goes for the Cheyenne Indians of the American Plains, the peace chiefs versus the marginal war chiefs. Um and so on. But let's build off of this, extending this hypothesis. So there's been a theoretical extension of this hypothesis called the generalized hypothesis. And the idea behind the new hypothesis is the same as the old, but it extends the idea to many other factors besides the family's wealth and status. So this new hypothesis suggests that if parents have a trait that they pass on to their children that is better for their sons and daughters, they'll have more boys. But if it's better for daughters, they'll have more daughters. Parental wealth and status are just two of the traits they can pass on to their children that are more beneficial for sons than for daughters, but there are many other factors. Brain types are another example of heritable traits. Strong male brains, which are good at systematizing, figuring things out, are more beneficial for sons than for daughters, while strong female brains, which are good at empathizing, so think autism and Asperger's on one side and empath on the other side, um, they're more beneficial for daughters to be empaths. So since brain types are heritable, the generalized hypothesis would predict that parents with strong male brains, such as engineers, mathematicians, and scientists, are more likely to have sons, while those with strong female brains, such as nurses, social workers, and school teachers, more likely to have daughters. And this is indeed the case. While the generic sex ratio is 105 boys for every 100 girls, the study shows that sex ratio among engineers is 140 boys for every 100 girls, while on the flip side among nurses, it's 140 girls for every 100 boys. So it's kind of, it kind of all shakes out and evens out, basically. 
And by the same token, tall and big parents have more sons and produce more male fetuses because size was a distinct advantage in male competition for mates, while body size has no particular advantage for women. And short and small parents have more daughters for the same reason. So now we get into the, uh, the titular question. Why do beautiful people have more daughters? Physical attractiveness can also bias the sex of your children. Unlike being tall and big, or having a tendency towards violence, which increases the reproductive success of only men and not women, being beautiful is good for both. But beautiful women have greater mating success than less attractive women, and handsome men do better than less attractive men. We know this. But beautiful men and beautiful women tend to do better in slightly different ways. Physically attractive women tend to do both well in long-term and short-term mating, while attractive men tend to do well mostly in short-term mating. And the reason for that, I would say, is that men who are very good-looking hit the genetic lottery if they can be cads and they're, they have an inclination toward being cads, they're going to do it. While the ones that are not inclined toward the cad strategy but the dad strategy, they get snatched up pretty quick because they're very valuable. So when we build off of this, it ties into the idea that women are more beautiful than men, right? So if women are more beautiful than men, on average, then it makes sense that if you're very attractive, that you're more likely to have a daughter because beauty is a huge indicator of reproductive success for women. So if you have genes for beauty and good looks and things like this, then it would make sense that you're more likely to have daughters. So the new hypothesis would therefore predict that physically attractive parents should have more daughters than sons. Once again, this is indeed the case. Young Americans who are rated very attractive have a 44% chance of having a son for their first child, and thus a 56% chance for having a daughter. In contrast, everyone else has a 52% chance of having a son. Being very attractive increases the odds of having a daughter by 36%. So, that's very interesting. So, if physical attractiveness is heritable, such that beautiful parents beget beautiful children, and less attractive parents beget similarly less attractive children, and if beautiful people are more likely to have daughters than sons, then it logically follows that over time, women will be more attractive on average than men. And that sort of answers that question. But why does the baby have daddy's eyes but not mommy's? So because of sexual asymmetries in reproduction, cuckoldry exists only for men. Paternal uncertainty, or parental uncertainty rather, that is uniquely a male problem. Mommy's baby, daddy's maybe, is what they say. So men who are cucked do not manage to transmit their genes to the next generation and achieve no reproductive success. So men are therefore selected to be very sensitive to cues of possible cuckoldry and to attempt to guard against the possibility. A man would therefore only invest in mate's children if he was reasonably certain that they were genetically his. In the absence of DNA tests, how could men ever be certain that the children were genetically theirs? So child's physical resemblance is probably the most common uh, cue, right? If the baby looks like the dad, it's more than likely his. Whereas if the baby looks nothing like him, or worse yet, looks a lot like his neighbor, <laughs> then it's doubtful he's the dad. So this leads Evo psychologists to predict that holding constant the probability of cucking, babies who resemble their dads are more likely to survive than babies who do not resemble them because the father of babies who resemble him is more likely to be convinced of his paternity and to invest in them, thereby increasing their chances of survival, whereas the father of babies who do not resemble him is less likely to be convinced of the paternity. So genes that make babies resemble the dad survive, whereas genes that make them resemble the mom don't. And so more and more babies come to resemble the dad until most babies are born resembling the dad, not the mom. And this is precisely what two psychologists at the University of California, San Diego, Nicholas Christenfeld and Emily Hill discover. So they show the subjects in their experiment a picture of children ages 1, 10, and 20, and a set of three pictures of adults, one of who's the real parent of the child. And they then ask the subjects to match the child with the correct parent. So they have a 33% probability of selecting the right parent by chance. If the child truly resembles the parent, then the subject should be able to match. A major finding in this experiment is that children in general do not physically resemble their parents. 
the subjects are not able to match the picture of the child at any age to the picture of either the mother or the father better than expected by chance. The only exception, however, is the matching of one-year-old babies to their father. The subjects are able to match both baby boys, 0.505, and baby girls, 0.48, to their father, though not their mother, at st statistically significantly greater rates than by chance. That means that one-year-old babies resemble their fathers, as might be expected from evolutionary psychological logic presented above. So the idea is this. Before I even invest in the kid, I should be able to have a mechanism in my brain that allows me to identify if this kid looks like me, basically. But after that, it seems to become less relevant. So the next question we need to ask is why are there so many deadbeat dads, but so few deadbeat moms? So when married couples with children get divorced, chances are the children stay with the mom. This is no secret. We talk about this in custodial cases. 86% go to the mom. Further, many of the non-custodial fathers who have agreed either voluntarily or via court order to pay child support default on their commitment and often become deadbeat dads. So the first survey was conducted in 78, reveals less than half of women awarded child support actually received the full amount and a little more than a quarter received nothing. So... On the surface, this massive sex difference in the dedication to parenthood might appear puzzling, since both the mom and dad are equally related to the child genetically, each transmits half their genes, yada yada yada. However, there are two biological factors that combine to make fathers less committed as parents than mothers. The first is paternity uncertainty, right? So, because of the gestation for all mammals, women know it's theirs, but dads aren't so sure. We know this, okay? So... When we're talking about contemporary industrialized societies, where paternity uncertainty, especially in court-ordered DNA tests, we see a lot of the time that paternity fraud happens, um, it's a very realistic possibility for any father in contemporary Western society um, to have some sort of mechanism in their mind that allows them to guard against that. So men are not motivated to invest in children who have a distinct possibility of not being genetically theirs. But women always have this maternity certainty. So therefore, because women have this maternity certainty, by default, they're more invested. But the second biological factor that makes fathers less committed parents is their high fitness ceiling, the best they can do reproductively. So if a woman has a baby, yeah, she could make more babies, but not as many as the guy can, which would be the second reason. He could just go start a new family. And if that fails, he could start another family. Theoretically. But we can't ignore the fact that, you know, some mothers aren't always good parents. Right? They're not better parents than fathers necessarily. And sometimes mothers even kill their babies. However, evolutionary psychological logic can even explain who is more likely to kill their babies and why. Statistics show that very young mothers by far are the most likely to kill their babies. And older mothers are the second most likely to do so. But for different reasons. Very young teenage mothers kill their babies because they still have most of their reproductive lives ahead of them, and they can make more babies in the future, even if they kill the one they just had. Having a baby under unfortunate circumstances, such as without a father investing, not only threatens the well-being of the baby, but also jeopardizes the mother's chance of finding a mate in the future. And teenage mothers are more likely to have their baby under unfortunate circumstances than others. But older mothers, above the age of 35, kill their babies for a different reason. They are more likely to have defective babies because of their age. Every child consumes parents' resources, since defective kids are much less likely to attain reproductive success from the purely genetic point of view. Any resources invested in such kids who will not have children themselves are wasted. Such children are taking away valuable resources from other children who have better reproductive prospects. So older mothers are more likely than younger mothers to have other children they must also raise. So parents are designed not to invest in defective kids. So it's very brutal. It's cold and heartless. But all nature cares about is the survival of the genes. That's what it cares about. But now this, this raises another question. The question is, why is family more important to women than men? This idea of parental investment and commitment and shit like this. Well, two sociologists, Lynn Smith-Lovin and J. Miller McPherson, propose an explanation for this universal phenomenon from the standard social science model perspective. 
using fictitious characters named Jim and Jane, they explain how the compositions of their personal networks remain more or less the same throughout adult years because Jim is serious about his career as an engineer. And the woman's network is basically her family, right? Who she has close bonds with. So that's kind of the core of it. But the change begins when they become parents. When their first child is born, Jane's mother comes to visit for two weeks. Jane begins to use her sister as a babysitter for daytime care while she is working because more of her time is taken up with the baby. Jane's networks become more centered on neighborhood and kin to some extent at the expense of her work and voluntary association with friends. Jim's work and group ties are less alternate. Okay. Now, Jane and Jim in this description accurately mirror what happens to many young couples when they have kids. Mom stays home, dad keeps working. Right? However, it raises the question, why is it Jane's mom, not Jim's, who come to visit after the baby is born? When Jim's mom is presumably as equally related to the baby as Jane's mom. Or is she? Same thing with Jane's sister versus Jim's sister. Are they? So why is it that, that it tends to be the woman's family that comes to help? And I do notice this in my own personal life. I've seen this as well. Evolutionary psychology can answer all these questions. Okay? We know why Jane becomes the primary caretaker of the baby, not Jim. Maternity certainty. That's why women invest more than men. So even though women are more motivated to make parental investment than men are, they cannot always do it alone. Sometimes they need help from others especially in the modern world where standards of living are very high. And this was especially true back in the ancestral environment where resources were scarce and life was precarious. So when mothers need help in their effort to raise their kids, nobody is more likely or willing to deliver it than their kin because maternity certainty. Mother's kin are more motivated to invest than the father's kin because the mother know for sure they are related. With the father's kin, not so much, Right. So two implications follow from this logic. First, if women maintain their ties to their kin in case they need help with their parental investment, then women who are materially better off should need less help from their kin, therefore have less need to maintain their ties with them. Second, women who are currently married should need less help from their kin than women without husbands, because even with residual paternity uncertainty, the putative fathers should be motivated to make some parental investment in the children and thereby lessen the mother's burden. The presence of the spouse should be of at least some help. Further, the logic implies that family income and being currently married should have no effect on the extent to which men have kin in their personal networks. So an analysis of large American data set confirms both of these predictions. A woman's family income and her currently being married both significantly decrease the proportion of kin in her personal network, whereas a man's family income analysis have no effect on the presence of kin in his network. So standard social science can't explain this pattern. And the last question in chapter five is why do girls of divorced parents experience puberty earlier than girls whose parents remain married? So Undead Chronic has talked about this before. This idea that, hey, when the dad is no longer in the home, women develop quicker in terms of puberty because they're looking for a replacement for a male figure, right? Developmental psychologists have known for nearly two decades that girls whose parents divorce early in their lives, particularly before the age of five, experience puberty earlier than their counterparts whose parents they married. Such girls are also more likely to start having sex at an earlier age, have a large number of sex partners, get pregnant while still a teenager, and experience divorce in their first marriage, aka daddy issues. Right. Since the biological purpose of puberty is to mark the onset of the reproductive career, it makes perfect evolutionary sense that girls who undergo puberty at an earlier age start having sex. Duh. Therefore, they have more sex partners and they get pregnant in an earlier age, right? Now, again, why does the presence or absence of the father at home during early childhood affect this? Well, there's two competing explanations for this. One is that girls who experience puberty early are genetically different from those who experience it late. And the other is that girls have similar genetic makeup, but respond to the environment differently by starting puberty early or late epigenetics basically. So which model is correct? In the case of pubertal timing, both models are likely to be partially correct. In support of the genetic model, there is substantial evidence that a girl's pubertal timing is largely heritable. About 50 to 80% of its variance is explained by genetic differences. 
In this model, girls who undergo it are simultaneously more likely to get a divorce because of their greater tendency towards promiscuity and to pass on their early puberty, greater promiscuity genes, to the daughters. I think it's the DRD4, the dopamine receptor gene that has been linked to um, promiscuity. So yeah, that's there. Hence, girls who grew up without a dad because their mother got a divorce and was never married are more likely to experience puberty early and to become more sexually promiscuous because they have inherited the genes that will predispose them to do so. Yes. So if you run into that, you can't reverse that, fellas. I'm sorry. It is what it is. So you're better off just steering clear of it. Now, while evidence supports the genetic model, environmental influences can also affect the actual timing of it within a window set by genes within the genetic wheelhouse, of course. And this phenomena is similar to other biological traits such as height, weight, or intelligence. Height, for example, is highly heritable. So children of tall parents on average become taller than children of shorter parents. Genes set the boundaries of potential adult height. Within these boundaries, however, environmental influences such as nutrition or child exposure to disease can determine the actual adult height. In other words, it can activate dormant genes and shit like this. So between 20 and 50% of timing is unaccounted for by genes. So the environmental conditions can still influence these things. Okay. And in this model, girls who grow up without a dad learn that men do not form lasting relationships with women and invest in their offspring. So they have to adopt a more fast life strategy in order to deal with that. And that's sort of how their, their, um, their psychology reacts to that, so to speak. Now, there is a piece of missing information from this explanation. In order for this strategy to evolve among women, men's tendency towards forming committed relationships and making parental investment must be stable across generations. The mother's experience with her mates must be highly predictive of the daughter's experience one generation later. One suggestion is that girls use the presence or absence of the father in the home as an indicator of the institution of marriage in the society. In this view, Father absence signifies not the man's unwillingness to form long-term relationships, but a high degree of polygyny in society. Self-extrapolation. In a highly polygynous society, married men are spread thinly among their multiple wives, and they cannot spend much time with any one of their wives or their offspring. Thus, the more polygynous the society, the less time any girl or boy spends with the father. In contrast, in monogamous societies, married men only have one wife, so they spend more time with the kids. So the degree of absence might be a micro-level indicator within the family of a macro-level degree of polygyny within the society is kind of the point. And it seems that within the savanna, our mind picked up on this and said, okay, well, from this internal micro-environment, the family, I'm going to extrapolate out to the macro. And we see this all the time. Well, this is my experience of the apex, so all men must be like this. And it seems that men kind of do this too. Well, this is my experience of, of shit at the micro, so it must all be like that. And it just sort of snowballs from there. So the kind of micro that you experienced growing up can play a big role in how you deal with the macro. So the biochemical mechanism, however, is not really well known. But Bruce J. Ellis suggests that pheromones emitted by the stepfather and other unrelated men in the house can also trigger early puberty in girls. And this is one of the remaining mysteries in evolutionary psychology. So the idea of maybe like why a stepfather might also trigger it, even though technically he's the father figure, um, doesn't really change anything because he's not genetically related probably. But obviously women are like, hey, if it's a polygynous society, I need to start getting on this puberty shit sooner so that I could be a junior wife or something like this. There might be something to that effect at play here. Okay? And that's pretty much it for chapter five. So yeah, this looks like this is going to be the longest video I ever did of all time. <laughs> We're up to chapter six. Guy's gone wild. Woo, lift your shirt up. Show your boobs. Moobs. <laughs> so this is the evolutionary psychology of crime and violence. Right? So what we're interested in, first off, is why are almost all violent criminals men? There are many cultural universals, features of human society that are shared by all known cultures. So Donald Brown provided the original list of human universals, wrote a book about them in 91, 
and Steven Pinker updated the list in 2002. Okay? Human culture is a manifestation of human nature at the level of society. Remember, culture doesn't cause the nature, the nature causes the culture. This is why all human cultures are more or less the same, and there are so many cultural universals. Among many of these universals is the fact that men in every human society commit an overwhelming majority of all crimes and acts of violence. Why? Why are men so much more criminal and violent than women? In their comprehensive study of homicide, the leading evolutionary psychologists Martin Daly and Margot Wilson note that humans throughout their evolutionary history were effectively polygynous. Many married men had multiple wives. In a polygynous society, some males monopolize reproductive access to all females while other males are left out. In such a society, some males do not get to reproduce at all, while almost all females do. Okay? This inequality of reproductive success between males and females makes males highly competitive in their effort not to be left out of the reproductive game because remember, it is more costly to, you know, assume a situation where the rewards of not competing outweigh the costs from a purely genetic reproductive standpoint. And this competition among men leads to high levels of violence, murder, assault, battery among them, and the large number of homicides between men compared to the number of homicides between women or between the sexes is a direct result of this male competition for mates, this fitness variance. So they note in the research that most homicides between men originate from what is known as trivial altercations. It starts off as something small and then it quickly escalates because a man's honor and reputation is at stake or something like this, right? And because of that, we have a situation where very quickly things get out of hand and somebody ends up dead. So the logic of something like the death penalty doesn't seem to really deter men. They're going to engage in violence anyway. It doesn't really seem to work. And more often than not, a lot of the murders we see are not really premeditated. They're usually like second degree, heat of the moment type things, right? Due to these evolutionary impulses. So... One of the ways that a man can elevate himself in this hierarchy is to engage in violence, right? So this applies to murder. It applies to property crimes. It, it applies to assault, right? If you can't get it through natural and legal means, you're going to do it through unnatural and illegal means. If you do not have resources to call your own, you're going to steal from people who have resources, and over time, what happened is we had norms that evolved against these crimes to sort of mitigate this type of behavior. So the idea that men steal in order to attract women might at first glance appear strange since theft and other forms of resource extortion are universally condemned in human societies. In fact, it's another cultural universal. It's quite possible, however, that the psychological mechanism that motivates people to commit such crimes evolved in the ancestral environment right? And before these norms against violence and theft came about, violent competition and the accumulation of resource through theft would not um, have been a detriment. Instead, it would have probably led to higher status and reproductive success. But then once the norms were introduced, ostracization is now the consequence. And now the costs through some sort of oofy doofy could cause it to no longer be cost effective. Okay, so the fact that violent and predatory acts that humans would classify as criminal are quite common among non-human species that don't have these types of norms and oofy doofy, it increases the confidence that this is the situation, that men use crime and violence as a means to climb the reproductive hierarchy. Yeah, but what about female criminals, right? Why do we have those? So the evolutionary psychologist Anne Campbell offers the staying alive theory of female criminality, which answers these questions and more. So it's the idea that offspring survival and thus reproductive success depends more heavily on maternal than paternal care and investment. It's therefore imperative for mothers rather than fathers to survive long enough to take physical care of their offspring to ensure their survival to maturity. So Campbell argues females are more risk averse than males are. The potential benefit of taking risks by engaging in physical competition for resources and mates, for instance, simply doesn't justify the potential cost, the very survival of their offspring, which heavily hinges on the mother's own survival. 
So not, don't put your life at risk. So a woman's primary goal is therefore to stay alive for the sake of her children. However, females do occasionally need to compete for resources and mates, especially when they are scarce. This is why women sometimes compete for a few good men, the men at the top, and occasionally resort to violence and theft to achieve their goals, even though consistent with their primary goal to stay alive, their tactics of competition are usually low risk, larceny rather than robbery, and spreading negative gossip instead of um, direct physical confrontation, right? So she argues that men and women do not differ in the benefits of aggression. High status men who are winners of male competition may get access to mates and thus more opportunities for sex, but high status women who are winners of female competition may get priority access to resources and greater protection afforded by high status males. So it's kind of a mirror here, mate guarding in both directions. So it's the cost of aggression that distinguish men from women. It's more costly for a woman to be competitive because her fitness variance is more narrow is the basic gist. But what do Bill Gates and Paul McCartney have in common with criminals? So they outline this idea of the, um, the curve, the, uh, the age genius curve or the age criminal curve. And what you're going to find is that basically in the teens up to the 20s, there's a spike in crime or a spike in genius and productivity and things like this. And then, like, as you get towards the tail end of the 20s and the 30s, it starts to level out, right? So, obviously, when men are really looking to mate, risk-taking behavior, trying to be more productive, and all these things come into play. Bill Gates inventing Microsoft, criminals committing crime and forming gangs, um, art, music, all these things, building society. It's all tied to reproductive success. Everything is done for sex, to some degree, right? That's why we do what we do. So the idea is that obviously at the peak where men are really looking to find a young, beautiful woman, that's when you're really going to see that spike. And what we tend to notice is that once men are married, once they are invested in a family and stuff like that, we begin to see it level off. Because the logic goes, if the means to the end, that is reproductive success, is to do all these things and you acquire the end, then you no longer need to put as much effort into the means. Same thing with pornography addiction, right? If you're getting the end and you're tricking your ooga booga into getting the end, then you have no means to put in the work to attract women because you are accomplishing the end by your own brain's faults, right? It's the same idea. And we see this, a lot of men who remain single and don't get married, they make some of their greatest scientific discoveries and contributions in older age, while married men, on average, tend to make their contributions at a younger age. So the idea here is that, obviously, given that human society has always been mildly polygynous, there were many men who did not succeed at securing mates and reproducing because they did not do these things that attracted mates. And these men had everything to gain and nothing to lose by remaining competitive and violent for their entire lives. But we're not descended from these men. We're descended from the winners. So in a way, everyone that currently exists has genes descended from winners in this fitness variance. But when we're looking at how that expresses itself. We see that it expresses itself very early on. And as a result of that, once the ends is achieved, we taper off. So the similarity between Bill Gates, Paul McCartney and criminals in evolutionary history points to one very important concept in evolutionary biology, which is female choice. In all species in which the female makes greater parental investment than the male, mating is a female choice. It happens when the female wants it to happen, with whom she wants it to happen, not when the male wants it to happen. Imagine for a moment a society where sex and mating were entirely a male choice. Individuals have sex whenever and with whoever men want, not whenever and with whomever women want. What would happen in such a society? Absolutely nothing, because people would never stop having sex. There would be no civilization in such a society because people would not do anything besides have sex. 
This, incidentally, is the evolutionary explanation for why gay men tend to have significantly more partners and have sex significantly more frequently than straight men do. Because there are no women in their relationship to say no. Yep. <laughs> so the comedian Bill Maher captures the essence of female choice perfectly when he quips, for a man to walk into a bar and have his choice of any woman he wants, he would have to be the ruler of the world. For a woman to have the same power over men, she'd have to do her hair. <laughs> Okay, so next, why does marriage settle men down? Um, I think I sort of covered this already, perhaps unintentionally. It's this idea that when men kind of reach that point where they've achieved the ends to the means, we start to see a decline in productivity and commitment to the means. So I think we'll just kind of fast forward past that one. And then the last one is why do some men beat up their wives and girlfriends? Why are they abusive? So critics of evolutionary psychology often claim that evolutionary psychological explanations are untestable and unfalsifiable. As but one perfect example of eminent testability and falsifiability of evo psych explanations, we offer two competing explanations of domestic violence. So when Martin Daly and Margot Wilson began studying this, domestic violence and uxoricide, which is the killing of one's wife in the early 80s, they had competing explanations. So Daly said that domestic violence and exorcide resulted when the husband did not value his wife sufficiently and mistreated her as a result. Since a wife's fertility and reproductive value declines with age, Daly predicted that older wives were at greater risk of spousal abuse and homicide than younger wives. Wilson, in contrast, hypothesized that domestic violence and exorcide were a maladaptive byproduct of the husband's inclination and tendency to guard his wife to make sure that she did not have sexual contact with other men. Because men should be more motivated to guard younger, more valuable wives, Wilson predicted that younger wives were at a greater risk of spousal abuse and homicide than other wives. So both of these explanations use evolutionary psychological logic to derive from known facts. Both, both predictions can't be true simultaneously. So Daly and Wilson got to work as the good scientists that they are, collecting data on this stuff from Canada and the U.S. and putting the two competing predictions to the test. And their data showed that younger wives were at much greater risk than their older counterparts. Right? So it turns out that Wilson was correct in this regard. So it is falsifiable. Now, astute readers may be thinking right now, but younger women are usually married to younger men. And younger men are more violent than older men as you point out in your discussion of the age crime curve, right? The violence and all that peaks at the younger age. So younger women are at a greater risk of spousal abuse and murder, not because they are young, but because their husbands are young and therefore more violent. Close, but no cigar. While it is difficult to separate the effects of the husband's age and the wife's age, careful statistical analyses show that the wife's age almost entirely determines the likelihood of being a victim of spousal abuse and homicide. Middle-aged husbands, 45 to 54, legally married in Canada to much younger wives, age 15 to 24, are more than six times as likely to kill their wives than young husbands, 15 to 24, married to women of similar age. Among common law marriages, middle-aged husbands married to much younger wives are more than 45 times as likely to kill their wives as young husbands. The effect of the wife's age is so powerful that it overrides and even reverses a man's tendency to become less violent with age. So the idea essentially is that this mate-guarding shit Age is not a barrier to it, all right? It's not a barrier to it at all. And it's basically an adaptation kind of gone in the wrong direction. And we should also shed light on the midlife crisis situation because we always kind of talk about how men go through a midlife crisis, allegedly. And many believe that men go through it when they are in midlife. Many middle-aged men do go through midlife crisis, but it's not because they're middle-aged, but because their wives are. Just as it is the wife's age, not the husband's, that determines the risk of spousal abuse and murder, it is the wife's age, not the husband's, that prompts the constellation of behavior commonly known as midlife crisis. So from the Evo psych perspective, a man's midlife crisis is precipitated by his wife's intimate menopause and the end of her reproductive career, and thus his renewed need to attract younger reproductive women. Because remember, we're naturally polygynous. So accordingly, a 50-year-old man married to a 25-year-old woman would not go through a midlife crisis. Think Leonardo DiCaprio, the dude's almost 50. While a 25-year-old man married to a 50-year-old woman would, just like a more typical 50-year-old man married to a 50-year-old woman would. It is not his midlife that matters, it is hers. 
So when he buys a shiny red sports car, he's not trying to regain his youth. He's trying to attract young women to replace his menopausal wife by trumpeting his flash and cash. Brutal. Absolutely brutal. But that's it for chapter six. Chapter seven talks about the idea that life is not fair or politically correct. It's the evolutionary psychology of political and economic inequalities. So these topics are a little bit more, less, not more, less researched than everything prior up until this point, right? But the first question they ask is why do politicians risk everything by having an affair, but only if they're male? Well, we begin with the idea of Bill Clinton, right? Why did Bill Clinton do this? Why did he cheat on his wife with Lewinsky? Well, because power and status, just like anything else, is a means to an end. The end is reproductive success. So if he's getting the reproductive success, you'll put it on the line because you're getting the the ends. Now, we had a Darwinian historian, Laura Betzig. She's written on mating behavior and reproductive success of politicians and other political leaders in history. And she points out that while powerful men throughout Western history have married monogamously, they have always mated polygynously. Many had harems consisting of hundreds and even thousands of virgins. And with their wives, they produced legitimate heirs. With the others, they produced bastards. Genes and inclusive fitness make no mis distinction between the two categories of children. While the legitimate heirs, unlike the bastards, inherited their father's power and status and often went on to have their own harems, powerful men sometimes did invest in the bastards too. So powerful men of high status throughout human history attained very high reproductive success, leaving a large number of offspring, legitimate or otherwise, while countless poor men in the country died mateless and childless. Right? So from Betzig's Darwinian historical perspective, the question that many Americans and others throughout the world asked in 98, why on earth would he do this? She said, why not? Right? So when we're talking about the underlying motive of all human behavior and that it's reproductive in nature, reproductive success is the purpose of all biological existence, including humans. They do much of what they do directly or indirectly, knowingly or unknowingly to achieve reproductive success. Attaining political office is no exception. So from this perspective, men strive to attain political power in order to have reproductive access to a larger number of women. In other words, reproductive access is the goal. Political office is the means, as we said. The only difference between Bill Clinton and the others is that he got caught. So the next question that comes up, of course, is why do men so often earn more money and attain higher status than women? So first, we're going to look at the traditional view, the social science view. So the sex difference in earnings is one of the central concerns of economics and sociology. Economists and sociologists identify three different parts of the total difference in earnings between men and women. First, there's a difference in what they call human capital. Education, job skills, training, and other individual traits that affect productivity and job performance. The meritocracy piece. Second, Sex difference in earnings can be due to occupational segregation by sex. The fact that men and women tend to occupy different jobs. Yes, systematic versus empathetic. Men tend to occupy blue collar jobs. Women tend to occupy pink collar jobs. Third, the sex difference is earnings can be due to sex discrimination where employers pay equally qualified men and women doing the same job differently, right? And that third one is the point of contention that many in the manosphere have an issue with. So to the extent that the sex gap in pay is due to differences in human capital and productivity, it is considered to be fair by most social scientists to extend that the sex gap in pay results from the existence of blue and pink collar jobs. Then paying all workers in a given occupation equally will not close the total sex difference in earnings. Paying the same wages to male and female truck drivers and to male and female secretaries will not close the sex gap in pay if truck drivers make more than secretaries and more, most truck drivers are male and most secretaries are female. It's just math. But because the sociologists are deeply wedded to this model, economists and sociologists assume that men and women are on the whole identical in their preferences, values, and desires. No, they are not. Any remaining sex differences in earnings have to be discrimination because they assume tabula rasa, which is wrong. 
The existence of discrimination, however, must always be inferred from statistical evidence and cannot be observed directly. Social scientists are not likely to witness an employer telling employees, I'm paying you more because you're a man, I'm paying you less because you're a chick. Right? Nor are employers likely to admit such practice if they indeed engaged in it. But the reality is men and women are different. The sociologists will conclude there's sex discrimination. But the conclusion that there is, it depends on the assumption that men and women are on average identical, tabula rasa, except in their amount of human capital and the jobs they hold. If on the other hand, men and women with the same amount of human capital and in the same jobs are nonetheless inherently and fundamentally different in ways that affect their earnings, for instance, in their preference and desire for earning money, then discrimination becomes unnecessary to explain the sex gaps in pay. If men and women are different in internal preferences and dispositions, such as their desire and drive to earn money, then no external factors such as employer discrimination or a glass ceiling become necessary to explain it. Right? Working part-time in favor of raising a family, being more agreeable and less likely to negotiate a raise, therefore being less driven, choosing um, jobs that don't pay as much because they're not willing to take on the physical dangers of the job in exchange for the compensation. This type of stuff. Legal scholar Kingsley Brown pioneered evolutionary psychological work on sex differences in the workplace, such as earnings and occupational sex segregation. So because of these pressures that men and women have faced throughout history, they possess different temperaments. Material resources and higher status were a man's essential means to reproductive success, while for women it was not. And because women preferred to mate with resourceful men of high status who could protect and invest heavily in their children, they cared about a man having that more than men cared about women having that. In contrast, physically taking care of children was a woman's means. As a result, women today who inherited their psychological mechanisms from their female ancestors are far less risk-taking because if their ancestors engaged in risky behavior and got injured or killed as a result, the kids would be fucked. So they're less status-seeking because status-seeking tends to be more aggressive and competitive, which is dangerous for women. So Brown suggests that men are much more single-mindedly devoted to earning money and achieving higher status than women are. Otherwise, they risk being reproductive failures. In a study of an American sample, men are significantly more likely to rank income as an important criterion for selecting a job than women are. The absolute sex difference is greater among teenagers than among older workers. So it is not a realistic response to a lifetime's experience of earning less than men, as feminists and other conventional social scientists might contend. In contrast, women place significantly greater emphasis on the criterion. The work is important and gives me a feeling of accomplishment for selecting a job. As Anne Moore and David Jessel, authors of Brain Sex, The Real Difference Between Men and Women State, in the end, the secret of male achievement in the world of work probably lies in the relative male insensitivity to the world of everything and everybody else. Men are very driven and focused on their work, in other words. So, jobs also pay higher wages when occupants work longer hours, they relocate to new cities, and uh, men are just more open to doing this than women are. And it's not that women do not want money or prefer less money to more. Nobody in their right mind does. It is instead that women are unwilling to pay the price to make the necessary sacrifices, such as the welfare and well-being of their kids, in order to advance in the corporate hierarchy and earn more, earn more money. So women are reacting to this by freezing their eggs, not having kids, and focusing on their careers, and that's great. But they're pricing themselves out of the market, and then they can't find a man. So you can see that from the 1960s to the 1980s, Right? Feminists have claimed that women earned only 59 cents for every dollar earned by men. The precise figure has since been revised upward to 64 cents in 86, 70 cents in 87, and according to President Clinton, 75 cents in 99. But their claim is that women still earn substantially less than men do. However, all of these comparisons ignore the inherent sex differences in dispositions and temperaments. More careful statistical comparisons of men and women who are equally motivated to earn money show that women now earn 98 cents for every dollar men make and sex has no statistically significant effect on workers' earnings. Adjusted for occupation and motivation, men today do not earn significantly more than women do. Just as most women are not single-mindedly motivated to earn money and attain higher status than the average men, they just expect men to have it at the finish line so they can fuck the winners, right? Once one breaks the glass ceiling, does it still exist is kind of the question. They want to achieve different things. And this naturally ties into, well, why are most neurosurgeons male and most kindergarten teachers female, right? Because the male brain, 
Baron Cohen's theory of the extreme male brain, right? Male brains are about systemizing. It's the drive to analyze, explore, and construct a system. The systemizer intuitively figures out how things work or extracts the underlying rules that govern the behavior of a system. And the purpose of this is to understand and predict the system or to invent a new one, right? So there's you know technical systems, natural systems, abstract systems, social systems, organizable systems, and motoric systems. And his definition of what constitutes a system is therefore very comprehensive and seems to include everything that has to do with things rather than people. Anything that is governed by logical and systematic rules is a system. This is kind of how the man is wired. So a neurosurgeon would have a mind like that. In contrast, the empath, not the autistic or the, um, or the Asperger's person, empathizing is the drive to identify another person's emotions and thoughts and to respond to them with an appropriate emotion, social calibration. Empathizing occurs when we feel an appropriate emotional reaction in response to the other person's emotions. The purpose of this is to understand, predict their behavior, and connect and resonate with them emotionally. In other words, it's about spontaneously and naturally tuning into other people's thoughts and feelings. People who are good at this can detect when an emotional change has occurred, what the cause might be, and what might make this person feel better or worse. They respond intuitively to the change. And... Also, they notice others' feelings, but also continually think about what the other person might be thinking. It's a defining feature of human relationships and also makes real communication possible. Social calibration, being good at this type of stuff, picking up on the nonverbal. Yes. So when we look at these two types of brains, it's obvious why men and women choose different lines of work. They're wired differently. But the last question that we're going to talk about in Chapter 7 is why is sexual harassment so persistent? Well, one of the unfortunate consequences of the ever-growing number of women joining the labor force and working side by side with men is that the increasing number of sexual harassment cases, particularly in the US, um, has gone up. And why is this? Well, is sexual harassment a necessary consequence of the sexual integration of the workplace? What is sexual harassment anyway? And how can evolutionary psychology explain it? So, talking about sex differences in the glass ceiling, right, that we just talked about, the evolutionary psychologist Kingsley Brown identified two types of sexual harassment cases, the quid pro quo, you must sleep with me if you want to keep your job and be promoted, and the hostile environment where the workplace is deemed too sexualized for workers to feel safe and comfortable. So those are two types of harassment. One's direct, one's indirect. Now, feminists and other sociologists, they tend to explain sexual harassment in terms of patriarchy and other nefarious ideologies. Uh, Brown, on the other hand, he locates the ultimate cause of both types in the sex differences in the evolved psychological mechanism and mating strategies, thereby seeking roots in biology rather than ideology, right? Studies unequivocally demonstrate that men are far more interested in short-term casual sex than women. We know this. 75% of undergraduate men approached by an attractive female stranger agree. None of the women approached by an attractive male do. Many men who want, um, many men who would not go on a date, rather, with the stranger, nonetheless agree to bang her. In another study, men on average desire nearly 20 sex partners in their lifetime. Women desire less than five. Libido gap. Men on average seriously consider having sex with someone after only one week of acquaintance. Women's average is six months. Quid pro quo and similar types of harassment are manifestations of men's greater desire for short-term casual sex than women's, and their willingness to use any available means to achieve their goal. Because remember, everything is a means to reproductive success, including power. So feminists often claim that sexual harassment is not about sex, but about power. But the reality is it's about both. Men use power to get sex, the means to the end. To say that it is only about power makes no more sense than saying that bank robbery is only about guns, not about money. The male-female differences in the desire for short-term casual sex are exacerbated by another male-female difference in evolved mechanisms. The woman's desire to understate her sexual desire in a particular man and to engage in token resistance. What does that mean? It's bullshit, basically. In one study, nearly 40% of undergraduate women admitted to saying no to sexual advances from a man even though they actually wanted to have sex with him to avoid social disapproval. Yes. So more than a third of these cases where the women initially said no eventually resulted in consensual sex. 
As the late behavior geneticist Linda Mealy eloquently puts it, that females are selected to be coy will mean that sometimes saying no really does mean try a little harder. But men aren't going to go through all this red tape to, un, you know, to deal with that nuance. Which means, ladies, you know, we could check your pup- uh, pupil dilation if your eyes are blue, but um, <clears throat> we're not saying be fully forthcoming, but be a little more forthcoming, and it will help. Because women sometimes do mean no when they say no, but it's not always the case, and you can't expect men to fucking just know that. However, compare this to hostile environments when men are equal opportunity harassers. So Brown explains the incidence of sexual harassment cases of the second variety, hostile environment as a result of sex differences in what men and women perceive as overly sexual or hostile. Men obviously are more attuned to this type of shit, and they're not as easily offended by this type of shit. Right? So what a court will do is they'll employ what a reasonable person would do, but by nature of the fact that men and women are different, that's already flawed. So you're determining whether a given workplace constitutes a hostile environment based on this reasonable person thing, right? But there is no reasonable person. As I just said, there's reasonable man and reasonable woman. So what a reasonable man and a reasonable woman perceive to be a hostile environment may be entirely different because men and women are different. So Brown questions the exclusive focus on the victim's perspective. While many women legitimately complain that they have been subjected to abusive, intimidating, and degrading treatment by their male colleagues and employers, Brown points out that long before women entered the labor force, men subjected each other to that shit. I could tell you from experience, me and my male co-workers, we shit on each other every day. Every day we do it. And it's fucking hilarious. Bro, sometimes like, you know, one of my co-workers will give me a really good roast and I'll be like, oh shit, that was so good. But you can't do that with women. You can't do it with women. You're on eggshells with them. For a woman to be that comfortable with you where you can joke with her about shit like that, oh man, it's not something you just do like that. But with a fellow man, yeah, you can, you can build that rapport like in fucking weeks. Like easily. It's not hard at all. But um, that, that, that's just a, a gap between us. So at the core though, Abuse, intimidation, and degradation are all part of a man's unfortunate repertoire of tactics employed in competitive situations, which a professional environment naturally is competitive. In other words, men are not harassing women in this fashion because they are treating women differently from men, right? Which is the definition of discrimination under which sexual harassment legally falls, but the exact opposite. Men harass women precisely because they are not discriminating with men and women. That is, men talk to the women the same way they talk to the men, and then they learn in real time, oh shit, men and women are different. Correct. Because of all the media attention and the soaring cost of litigation, most American firms and universities now have sexual harassment policies that categorically prohibit any sexual relations between and among their employees. And Brown makes a sharp observation in this connection. Although sexual harassment surveys typically ask whether the respondent has ever been subjected to unwanted sexual advances in the workplace, they seldom, if ever, ask whether she's been subjected to welcome sexual advances. Nobody ever covers that. That's a very good point. Nobody ever talks about that. And the answer must commonly be in the affirmative, since a large number of workers find their romantic partners at work. Yes. Think about it, right? We talk about warm approach all the time. Where the fuck are you going to meet people? In your social circles. One of the most common social circles. Work. So yes, if you and the woman in question, like you resonate with one another, this policy actually goes against that and actually fucks up your reproductive success. So men's and women's behavior that sometimes results in charges of sexual harassment is most often simply part of the normal repertoire of human mating strategies. They work well most of the time, as when a large number of men and women find satisfactory long-term and short-term mates in the workplace, but occasionally result in miscommunication and misunderstanding due to the evolved differences. And that translates to the label of sexual harassment. I did not find this guy attractive. He thought I did. Sexual harassment. But because you make a, a policy that basically says nobody could fuck with anybody, there's potential pairings there that could have been very, very good. But they will never come to pass because of these policies. So basically what ends up happening is we have this situation where it could actually be detrimental to the mating strategy, detrimental to women's sexual interests just as much as men's. But again, I think when you consider that most women do not find most men 
attractive. That is, they don't desire most men, but most men desire most women. And then you stuff all those people in the same workplace. This is what you get. Okay. And that is chapter seven. Man, we're coming up on three hours now. Jesus Christ. Here we go. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The evolutionary psychology of religion and conflict. This is good shit. Let's get into it. The first question is, where does religion come from? It may be tempting to believe that religion is an adaptation, or in our language, an evolved psychological mechanism designed by evolution, uh, natural sexual selection, and so on, since there are genetic and biological bases of religion. All human societies practice religion, making it one of the cultural universals, be it polytheistic or monotheistic, whatever. And certain parts of the brain are involved in religious thoughts and experiences. However, this explanation of religion as an adaptation runs into one significant problem. What is the adaptive problem that religion is designed to solve, right? Because when you have an adaptation, the idea is that it solves a problem. The reason why humans have this out of the box is because in the ancestral environment, it solved a problem. But many recent evolutionary psychologist theories on origins of religious beliefs share the view that religion is not an adaptation in itself, but a byproduct of other adaptations. In the same way that certain behaviors may be a result of polygenic, it may not be one gene, but a, a grouping of genes that influence a particular thing that we see in the observable world. This is kind of like a similar idea. Multiple adaptations in concert resulted in this as a byproduct. So in other words, these theories contend that religion itself did not evolve to solve an adaptive problem so that religious people can live longer and reproduce more successfully, but instead emerges a byproduct of adaptations that evolved to solve unrelated adaptive problems. When our ancestors faced some ambiguous situation, such as rustling noises nearby at night, or a large fruit falling from the tree and hitting them on the head, they could attribute them to impersonal, inanimate, unintentional forces, such as wind blowing gently, to make the rustling noises among the bushes and leaves, the mature fruit falling by its own weight, and so on. Or they could say it's personal, intentional, a predator sneaking up or something like this. So which is it? Well, you can't really be sure. So there's two ways you can look at this. False negative, false positive. So when we're looking at the false negative versus the false positive, they could say that the event is an intentional force when in fact it was caused by unintentional forces, which is a false positive, or they can assume the inverse, that eh, it's just the wind when it's really not, a false negative. So the question becomes, well, which is more dangerous? Well, the consequences of false positive errors were that our ancestors became unnecessarily paranoid and looked for predators and enemies where there were none, which naturally it pays to be paranoid. You're less, you're less likely to get eaten by a predator because you're paranoid. The other thing, when you're more carefree, you're more likely to stumble into a trap and get eaten by a predator. So theorists call this innate human tendency to commit false positive errors rather than false negative errors animistic bias or the agency detector mechanism. These theorists argue that evolutionary origins of religious beliefs and supernatural forces come from such an innate bias to commit false positive errors rather than false negative. The human brain, according to them, is biased to perceive intentional forces behind a wide range of natural physical phenomena because the cost of committing false negative errors is much greater right? So Pascal's wager would be an example. Hey, listen, right? If you believe in God and it turns out it's not true. All right. But if you don't believe in God and you're wrong, you go to hell. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the, the situation where the false negative would be more costly for you if you turned out to be wrong. So it's like, okay, what do you have to lose by believing? And that's kind of, um, the idea. Now, the next question is, why are women more religious than men? So there's something else about religion that is culturally universal. Women in virtually every society are more religious than men. A worldwide survey asked more than 100,000 people from 70 different countries and regions the following two questions. Do you believe in God? And independent of whether you go to church or not, would you say you're a religious person? Um, not a religious person or a convinced atheist. By these measures, with only a couple of minor exceptions, women in all nations and regions are more religious than men based on these two questions. So the sex differences are greater in some countries like Russia than in others like the US and so on. Okay, 
But why is this? Why are women more religious than men in virtually all cultures and throughout history? What explains the universal difference? As with all other sex differences, the standard social science model offers a blanket explanation of gender socialization. Social scientists in the standard social science model tradition contend that women are socialized to be nurturing and submissive, qualities that make religious acceptance and commitment more likely. Similarly, they argue that the role of the mother subsumes religiousness, since it involves such activities as teaching the children morality and caring for the physical and spiritual welfare of other family members. Right? So that is pretty much the argument from the sociologist perspective, right? But for the standard social science model, it turns out that there is not much empirical support for these explanations. Women are more religious than men, both in traditional societies where women receive strict gender socialization and in modern societies where it's not really that strict. So the experience of child rearing appears unrelated to women's religiosity. Career women are just as religious as housewives and both are far more religious than men. So there's no real evidence to back it up. So the sex difference directly follows from Evo psych theory of the origins of religious belief and the sex difference in risk taking. You'll recall that the evolutionary origins are in risk management. It's less risky to infer agency uh, and be wrong than it is the other way around. It's error management strategy to minimize the total cost of errors by predisposing the human brain to commit more false positive errors than false negative when the former is less costly. So if women are more risk averse than men, it makes sense that women are more religious than men because they're more um, attuned to the idea of avoiding risk because the costs of taking on risk are much higher for women. The next question is probably the most controversial one in the whole book. Why are most suicide bombers Muslim? So um, I'll kind of give you the short version. The short version is that polygyny is very common in um, the Arabic world, which means a lot of men could get cut out of the dating pool. So a lot of men are going without sex. That is the ends is out of reach. They can't get sex. And we know that when this happens and the fitness variance gets wider, men get more violent. Men get more violent in order to climb up this hierarchy and get mates by whatever means necessary sometimes. So if 50% of men have two wives each, then the other 50% don't get any wives at all. If 25% of men have four wives each, then three quarters of men don't get any opportunities at all. So polygyny increases competitive pressure on men, especially young men of low status, who are most likely to be left without reproductive opportunities when older men of higher status marry polygynously. So they resort to violent means to gain access to mates because they don't really have much to lose and much to gain by doing so. And that can range from violent crimes to assault, murder, you name it. So the first unique feature of this particular part of the world um, is polygyny. But that's not really the whole equation, is it? Because polygyny by itself increases violence, it's not sufficient to engage in suicide bombings. That's insane. For example, societies in sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean are much more polygynous than the Muslim nations in the Middle East and Northern Africa. 18 of the 20 most polygynous nations in the world are sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean. Accordingly, nations in these regions have very high levels of violence and sub-Saharan suffers from a long history of continuous civil wars, but not suicide bombings. So the other key ingredient is the promise of the 72 virgins. There is a higher reward to engage in this suicide bombing than there is in not doing so. And that's why the violence goes to that extreme. But we also see... You know, William Costello, shout out to him. He talks about how incels are kind of the new Vikings, right? In the old days, incels were sent out to war to die. And then that's kind of how they dealt with that surplus. But despite the fact that we're seeing this, the violence, incel violence only accounts for like 60 deaths in the world currently. So in regards to that specifically, what we're seeing is actually more self-inflicted violence among incels, not outward violence. But it just comes to show you that the propensity for violence, whether self-inflicted or outward inflicted, um, it seems to happen either way in response to 
the dating market being monopolized by the lucky few, so to speak. Okay, and that's pretty much what we're looking at there. And then the next question is, why is ethnic and nationalist conflict so persistent throughout the world? So if you pay attention to the world news, you know that ethnic and nationalist conflict has unfortunately been a constant feature of human history, right? It's no exaggeration to say that there has not been a region or historical period that has not been affected by some sort of ethnic and nationalist conflict. But why? Why is this the case? Well, nationalism and other forms of ethnic movement pose a puzzle, especially for sociology, called the rational choice theory. Um, so all benefits of successful nationalist and ethnic movements, such as ethnic independence, political autonomy, state recognition, and shared equally by everyone. Um, so everyone gets to benefit from that, is the point. So let's say you have an ethnic group that gets independence. It doesn't matter if they contributed to the cause or not. They get the benefits of the independence regardless. So free riders and zealots, they, they say. They enjoy the same level of freedom and independence. So why then would anybody risk injury and death in order to bring about the change? In any situation like this, it is always rational to free ride, and no rational actors will ever contribute. If everyone is rational, then no one will contribute to the cause, and will not get off the ground let alone succeed. So how then can any movement ever succeed? So it's a rational choice for the genes. Once again, EvoCite can solve puzzles left unresolved by sociology. Joseph Whitmeyer was a student of Pierre L. Van den Berg, whom we have encountered a couple times earlier. Whitmeyer argues and mathematically proves that any gene that inclines its carriers to help others whom they might marry or those whose children their children might marry or those whose grandchildren their grandchildren might marry, etc., will be favored by evolution and thus spread. By contributing toward the welfare of other members of such an extended family or tribe, ethnicity, so to speak, you are essentially providing benefits for your genetic offspring, both distant and near. Whitmire argues that what usually passes as an ethnic group is essentially such an extended family because members of ethnic groups tend to intermarry. So his insight into what is economically irrational to contribute toward ethnic and nationalist movements, as the rational choice theorists point out, because the benefits of such um, successful ethnic collection action cannot be excluded from free riders. It is nonetheless evolutionarily and biologically rational. It is irrational from the individual's perspective. It is rational from the gene's perspective. So there's good and bad news. The bad news is that our tendency towards ethnocentrism, our desire to help and promote others of our own kind is probably innate because they assume that humans are born blank slates. Social scientists have always argued that individuals are born entirely free of prejudice but learn to be racist and ethnocentric through childhood socializations, usually by racist parents. But EvoPsych in general suggests that it's unlikely to be the case. Humans are instead born racist and ethnocentric and learn through socialization and education not to act on such innate tendencies. Humans are innately ethnocentric because ethnocentrism, helping others of one's group's members at cost of all others, was adaptive in the ancestral environment. But the good news again is that it can be taught. All right, but it seems like the only way to overcome that ethnocentrism type deal is um, something that ethnocentrists would very much be against, which would be um, interbreeding, building the bridges quite literally through fucking. <laughs> and then the last one is, well, why are single women more likely to travel abroad and why are young single men more likely to be xenophobic? So I'll kind of give you the quick version on this one as well. Men, pretty much single men, they only have their status and money and things like this um, and other, you know, marks of, you know, high level status and um, other, I guess, ornamentation physically and stuff like this to indicate that they're, they're worth anything, right? So if that's the case, we would agree that culturally on the surface, What's considered high status in one country might not be the same in another. So a man could go from country to country to country, and maybe what's valuable in America is not valuable in Russia. Maybe what's valuable in the Philippines is not valuable in India, and so on and so on and so on. However, when a man becomes married, now he has a woman on his arm, which indicates to other women, okay, if one woman deems this guy valuable, he must have something going on. 
pre-selection, and thus what's called mate choice copying occurs as a result of this pre-selection. If he's valuable, then I think, again, he's been vetted by this woman, so therefore he must be valuable, so therefore my desire for this person is warranted, or something to this effect. Women, though, young and beautiful. That's a universal. That's everywhere. A woman could go to any country in the world. If she is young and beautiful, she will attract men. It's not a problem. But just because a man has high status and wealth in one place does not necessarily mean that that's worth a fuck in another place because what constitutes wealth and status in another place might be different. A different oofy doofy. Fucks things up. So therefore, the men are more likely to kind of cocoon themselves and find other like-minded people and things like this, which is why a lot of these xenophobic organizations are predominantly men. It's not unheard of that women aren't in it, but this seems to be the working hypothesis for why this is the case. Okay? And that's pretty much chapter eight. So now we just have some final questions, some concluding things. Stump the evolutionary psychologists. The first question they ask about is, well, what about homosexuals? How do you explain homosexuality when it places so much emphasis on reproductive success heterosexually? Well, if there is a gay gene or genes that we eventually discover in sequence, it won't explain how such genes can survive if their carriers are exclusively predominantly homosexual, unless, of course, those genes are present in their sisters. Then those sisters can pass on those genes. And that's kind of the current working model that we have here for this particular question. However, no one has found the genetic basis for female homosexuality. However, I can't help but wonder, well, can't men, can't their brothers carry the genes? Why can't that be? Perhaps someone can answer that in the comments. Um, But also from what I have seen, men tend to be a lot more rigid in their sexuality. They tend to say, hey, you know, this is the camp I'm in. That isn't like we have bisexual men. Of course we do. But more often than not, when a man is homosexual or heterosexual, they tend to, that tends to be their camp. Tends to. Not always the case. Of course, we don't deal with absolutes. While women, they're a little bit more open to experimentation, which is reflected in polygyny and things like this. You don't think there were threesomes and shit like that and all that? Of course there was. So maybe that's why female homosexuality can pass on. Because, again, in polygyny, you know, there might be genes where women might be open to same-sex experiences, fucking around with each other and stuff, and those genes get passed on. While homosexuality, for men, it seems to make sense that, hey, in order for the genes to pass on, you need a baby to be made. And um, that would mean that, um, you know, their sisters or genetic relatives would have to have those genes. But... When you look at it, um, when you consider that he actually kind of makes a point here, um, if so, the liberation of homosexuals, which allows them to come out of the closet and not pretend to be straight, may ironically contribute to the end of homosexuality, because also there were a lot of sham marriages with kids, and men passed on genes like that as well. But I think nowadays, like, gay guys can be sperm donors and have a surrogate mother do it, so I don't think it's going to be the end of homosexuality. I don't think that at all. But, um, yeah seems to be that, yeah, sham marriages probably played a role um, because it was considered taboo back in the days, but also probably genetic relatives carrying the genes, being carriers of the genes, but not expressors of the genes also probably played a role, all right? And maybe the gene for same-sex preference um, isn't gender-specific. That is, maybe you don't need a gay guy um, to have a gay sister uh, in order, for example, a daughter to turn out gay. Maybe the fact that the gay gene exists at all, it's not, it doesn't discriminate based on sex. So maybe a gay guy with a gay sister can have a daughter, and now that daughter is gay. I have two cousins. They are related, brother and sister, and they are both gay. So, you know, maybe there's something to that. Okay, so that's the first question they ask. The second one is, why are siblings often so different um, from one another? And I think the way they answered this is that, um, you know, the older siblings, they tend to be more family oriented, while the younger ones tend to be more rebellious. Um, I know definitely my brother, he's a lot more conservative than I am. That is for sure. Um, so, yeah, they're born into a family without any siblings with whom to compete for parental resources. So they grow up to identify with the parents and other authority figures. But 
you know, later borns are born into a family in which there are older siblings who have already taken the niche of identifying with the parents, so they have to carve their own path. But I also think also, and I don't know if he covered it in this book, but the idea that the he actually does mention the 50-0-50 rule. Yes, he does mention it. So the 50-0-50 rule, for those who know, is that approximately on average, 50% of your behaviors are genetic, 50% are from the environment with your peers outside of your family, while approximately zero is from shared environment like family. Is that exact in all cases? Absolutely not. But that being said, the reason why siblings might turn out different from each other is because their social circles are different. So therefore, genes express differently. Then you have situations like, well, why do some people choose to have fewer no kids and why do some people self-delete? Right? So the genetic influence on how many children people have, that seems to go against evolutionary logic. Seems people who have many siblings because their parents had many children themselves have many children and people who have few siblings because their parents had few children themselves have few children. So if you have many siblings, you don't have to have many kids because you can count on your siblings to have kids. But if you yourself don't have any siblings, then it's kind of on you to pass on the gene. While the self-deletion thing, I mean, just because acts of violence, the aggression response generally is outward, it doesn't mean that it can't be inward sometimes. And especially when you have an oofy doofy that makes it illegal <laughs> to act on that violent impulse, sometimes the only way for that outlet to go is inward. So maybe that could be something worth noting. And we definitely see that with incels. Um, in the forums, like 80 plus percent of men were contemplating that. So, you know, maybe that's worth looking into in the Evo psych field. Why do people kill their own children? Well, again, this question kind of went answered because a lot of the data, like again, because when they collect the police reports, they don't ask, is it the biological dad or a stepfather who did it? But after the fact, when they looked into the data, they confirmed that a majority of the time it was actually stepdads, not biological dads that were killing the kids. Basically like a Cinderella type effect where like the step parents were complete fucking assholes. Um, and then what else does he have here? Why do soldiers die for their countries? So this is, a, I think, an unanswered question. But I think, again, they look at it like, well... If the society that facilitates the survival of my children doesn't exist because we lose the war, then by not going to war, the very livelihood in which my children can thrive is at stake. But again, what happens when men don't have any reproductive, sec um, reproductive success and they don't have any kids or anything like that? What happens? The men lay down their weapons and like, fuck you, I ain't fighting for you, you don't care about me. And we do see that. Um, other questions that come up is why do children love their parents? Um, why do parents in advanced industrialized nations have so few children? That's the idiocracy question. Why do people find a tan attractive? Why do men hog the remote control? Now it's kind of like joking questions at this point. There's like basically implying that there's so much stuff we don't know yet in evolutionary psychology that we still need to explore more. Okay. But as you can see, this was a very, very lengthy video, but I thought this book was very good. Um, it really gives you a primer for evolutionary psychology and so on. So I felt it was imperative to kind of bring this to the forefront when talking about Evo Psych so that you understand that just simply jumping in with the sociologists who can't explain everything um, blindly without even looking at the other side, that's just uh, intellectually irresponsible on your part and you owe it to yourself to at least kind of, kind of dig into this stuff and, and learn a little bit more. Okay, so this is a long video, as I said. So again, it's going to be chopped up into timestamps, probably by the question being posed, so that you can kind of go to the part that's relevant to you, um, so on and so forth. Um, but that's all I really got to say about this. Most of this stuff seems pretty intuitive, given how long I've been in the space digging through this information, but it might seem new and novel for some of you as well. Moral of the story is that very much like the rest of your body, your brain evolves along certain paths, and it makes your behavior more predictable than you think. And arming yourself with this information and being knowledgeable about it will give you a greater understanding of the interactions that happen around you so that ideally um, you can tap into 
the, I guess, better genetic inclinations that you may have instead of wasting your time on shit that is not to your benefit, man or woman. Anyway, feel free to leave a like, feel free to leave a dislike, call me an asshole, whatever you do, don't report the video, it's good information, probably will help somebody. If you're enjoying the content, hit sub. If you're not enjoying the content, hit unsub, it's all good. As long as you get this info somewhere, there's plenty of places to get it, it's fine with me. Um, that being said, I want you to understand this stuff because when you understand this stuff, you're less prone to start getting depressed uh, because you have an intuitive understanding. It makes it easier for you to accept it for what it is. And that, of course, prevents self-deletion when you reach that point of peace, which, of course, has always been priority one. And giving you the comprehensive library is what it's all about. And ladies, if you're watching, this is the kind of stuff we talk about. And hopefully you found some valuable insights as well. As always, I'm that guy, Pete. You refuse to invite to gatherings. It's probably going to be a while before I uh, do another video because this was a long one. I'll see you for the next one. So hopefully this keeps you sated for a while. Later.